Yeah. Yeah. What's up, everybody? Um, this is the very first edition of Form Terror Fridays 2.0, um, which means it's going to be a YouTube live broadcast on a Friday of my choosing for probably every month. It's going to be sick. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I'm super stoked to have this new chapter kind of beginning from what I used to do on Instagram. Um, I just feel like there was more that I, there was more potential for things to happen and Instagram was kind of limiting uh, in some of that. So I'm really stoked to be doing this on YouTube. Uh, I popped on here a little earlier than six o'clock so I can give people a chance to join and give like a slight introduction. Um, if you're not familiar with Form Terror Fridays, uh, it is it was a passion project started in 2021 um, where I would go live with artist guests. Um, we would talk about different process and technique and inspiration and influence and uh everything that you know goes through the head of a of a, a a similar artist um especially for heavy metal heavy music in general uh things that are dark evil gross you know that kind of shit um i feel like it's a niche and there's like you know there's something to be exposed and shown about that and i feel like a lot of people um out there are interested in understanding what's behind the veil with with you know metal artwork um it's a huge part of why we know music that we like in metal it's almost i mean i consider it to be 50 percent the reason why people are enjoying the music it's like if you are walking into a record store and you see a sick artwork piece of artwork on a on a cover that's what's drawing you to it before you've even had a chance to listen to it so it's really important to me to you know embrace what that creativity and how that creativity came about and so i've been a you know a total nerd about it for as long as i can remember i do it myself and it's just something that i feel like people would dig learning about um Cause there's a lot of sick artists out there doing really cool shit. So, um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so we're live and I've got a few people joining. Please feel free to comment, um, throughout. Uh, we will do, I will do my best to highlight some of the things that people say every once in a while. Uh, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not going to try. I'm going to try to, uh, acknowledge, <laughs> people uh, talking, even though, you know, the most important thing is to be talking to my guest, which uh, I think uh, I'll get into that now. Um, I am very fucking stoked to be talking to Robin Harris, aka Mystic Barbarism. It's going to be a fucking awesome conversation. We're going to learn a lot about his artwork and there's going to be visuals. We're going to be able to look at stuff up close and talk about all sorts of things that went into the pieces. Um, and I'm, I'm just, um, I'm honored to be able to say that this is my first guest. Um, he's an awesome artist. So <clears throat> I think it's a good time to bring him out and start the show. Um, yeah, let's, let's fucking do this. Let's get him on here. What's up, man? Howdy. <clears throat> Once again, I just want to thank you for being a part of this thing that I'm doing. Um, it's it's the new you know chapter of the show, so uh, it means a lot. Thank you. Thanks, dude. Thanks for having me. It's cool. I've never done That's anything new. like this, so uh, it's new for me too. <laughs> it's cool, man. We're it's gonna be really chill. You know what I mean get get a beverage fucking we're just gonna hang out and talk art that's that's what it's all about um yeah. you know yeah. 
So let's start with, I'm going to probably bring up some visuals a little later. So we could just start with an introduction. Um, you live in Vancouver, in British Columbia, do you not? Yeah, I do. Hell yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've lived here. I've lived, I grew up in Abbotsford, which is like an hour away from Vancouver. Yeah. Um, and uh, But I've lived in Vancouver for uh, five years or something. Right on, man. Yeah. And you're in that band Warm Witch. That's fucking sick. I took a listen to that the other day. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it, man. It's very cool. Yeah. Hell yeah, we're in the process of writing a new record right now. We're recording in maybe September or so. Nice, nice. On Profound Lore. We're pretty stoked about that. Yeah, dude. Chris Bruni's the man. Profound Lore <laughs> rules. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I really enjoyed... Um, <clears throat> I have a little bit of a like a text kind of thing that I wanted to read um, now that I'm remembering, uh, <laughs> of course uh <clears throat> a little bit of an introduction for you if that's okay sure. um so not only the bassist vocalist of black metal tyrants worm Witch, hailing from vancouver british columbia but he's an incredible ink artist whose use of black and white is reminiscent of harry clark and aubrey beardsley similarities can be seen in his treatment of positive and negative space highlight and shadow with his application of white on black and black on white. Having created stunning works for bands Full of Hell, Demiser, Crawl, and Devil Master, to name just a few heavy hitters, I'm delighted to have him as my very first guest on Form Terror Fridays 2.0. So thank you, man. Cheers, man. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, that was, I guess, out of order. <laughs> I would have done that soon, you know, or first, but, you know, there's going to cool. be kinks working out here. <laughs> Um, but yeah, man. Um, so yeah, I, and I also wanted to make sure that I told you that I think I enjoyed heaven that dwells within the most. Um, I okay. listened to everything that you've put to put out and it was, it's rad, but I wanted to also say that it really kept me engaged. I feel like some black metal just kind of like, you know, falls off and it's just kind of very, uh, kind of similar, uh, throughout, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I thought it was really awesome, like the dynamic that you uh, that you have put together, and the like orchestrating the songs is really cool. So that's cool. Thank you. Uh, it's funny. I mean, a lot of people like that record, and I don't like that record. <laughs> I, I don't don't mean to to be a, a party pooper, but uh, it's like <laughs> I think it's uh, I don't know. It's, we were, we tried really hard to make that record, and I yeah. think the process kind of ruined it for me a little bit. But, I got gotcha. you. Uh, we since then, you know, we, we started out as like a hardcore and like kind of like a crust band, right? Um, and like our earlier iterations or, or earlier bands that then turned into Worm Witch or whatever. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but we and we kind of went back in that direction with Wolf X and but. I think that if you like Heaven That Dwells Within, you'll like the new stuff we're working on, which I think honors that record, even though it's yeah. 10 times better. <laughs> yeah, but, dude, uh, I, yeah. I enjoyed the newer, the single that you put out too. Um, right. And there's there's one with a split that you have coming out uh, too, yeah. right? Yeah. Hell That's yeah. Coming out soon, I honestly can't remember when it's coming out. But, uh, right on. Yeah, just definitely got the check out Warm Witch. Half of them split, so. Say sorry again. I was just saying we just received the other band's half of that split uh, recently. So nice. Kind of waiting nice. for that to come. But, yeah. Sadistic rituals, rad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Joe, the only guy I know from that band is Joe, and he was also mm. in club for a while. And I love those guys. So nice. Hell yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I feel like someone uh, from Ectovoid is in Sadistic Ritual. Uh, if they are, I. I'm not, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm. I'll have to look that up, but <clears throat> I have to look that up. Um, yeah, man. Um, all right, let's talk about art. Um, yeah. I guess I'm gonna keep it simple and just ask, uh, what you what got you into art? You know what I mean? Like, what what pushed you to uh, pick up a pen? <clears throat> uh, I 
mostly, I mean, it was like a compulsive or impulsive, I don't know, activity that I was doing with my buddies as a kid. Like, mm -hmm. uh, we would play video games and we would draw and we would play with action figures all kind of in much the same way, you know, like, uh, making up characters and just drawing crazy shit, uh, yeah. the skeleton warriors and fantasy stuff. And I was often drawing characters from video games that I was playing as a kid, uh, like nice. Jack and Baxter and stuff like that. Um, and I think I just, I don't know. I, I actually have a memory of my mom telling me that my teacher had told her <laughs> when yeah. I was learning to write that my teacher was observing that it looked like I was not, that I was drawing the, the letters. Yeah. Um, which, uh, so I don't know. I think it's like always been something that I did and I, uh, I don't know. We just did it for fun. So, but I, but I actually stopped for a really long time after I graduated from high school and I was mostly focused on music and uh, just struggling to find a place to live and make money and stuff. And I wasn't drawing at all. And I mm -hmm. didn't pick up drawing again until I was like 25. So like five years ago ish. Um, and it was kind of a, it was a situation where I wanted something very specific for a music project, a dungeon synth project that I was trying to make. And oh, yeah. uh, I didn't want to use dead people art and I, but I wanted something very specific and I had got a friend of mine to do a drawing and I, I, I was tr struggling to communicate what I wanted and I, and I just was like, fuck it. I'm just going to draw it myself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it didn't work, but like I felt, <laughs> I felt as though I could do it, and sure, uh, it was kind of like a a moment where I was like, I have to decide what I want to do with my life, and mm -hmm. this was always it was always kind of a thing that I saw myself doing. I wanted to be like, a, I wanted to make video games when I was a kid, and I wanted to make art for video games, which it's not what I do now, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to do it now, honestly. Uh, <laughs> totally different arena. I didn't know anything about it really at the time but uh yeah yeah so i was just like you know what i'm gonna do this and now i have i having connection to music world and stuff like that really kind of just i knew exactly what it was that i wanted to do i knew exactly right. what people were looking for and so i had that kind of direction and it just i don't know from there um, it's just a matter of chaining myself to the table and forcing myself to do it yeah man i'm definitely with you there i get you um so you mentioned uh drawing the letters is that coming from like old like medieval books where they show like the first letter before like yeah like i'm just curious like what kind of did you check out books that inspired you uh when you were like younger with artwork uh no i think it was mostly just like a quality of the way that i was producing i mean this is like almost before memory for me i could like beg, I'm, oh. I'm talking like second or third grade oh shit yeah um <laughs> so like i do know that at that time or around fourth grade was yeah. when i started becoming obsessed with the middle ages yeah um, and i had those like uh i think i have one here oh sick yeah please we it's welcome good. any visuals you want to uh put out oh hell yeah you know these books like where but you get to see like the huge structure of uh, let me just try and find like it. a castle and and it's showing the cutaways, and I would just spend fucking ages like looking at these. Uh, I'm gonna find a good example here. How like, old were you when you looked at these? <clears throat> this would be like elementary school, like nice. As it just I don't know, exploring the little people like walking around and seeing what they're doing and right on. Um, uh, so that's something that I like to include in my art now. Nice. Uh, I definitely see, you know, how much you embrace like medieval um, imagery. And I, I feel like I would like to talk to you about your influence. Um, am I wrong in thinking that, you know, Aubrey Beardsley and Harry Clark are, are playing a, a, a preliminary role in your uh, influence? Yeah. Um, early on when I, 
first started getting into drawing again, I was obsessed with H.J. Ford and Beardsley. Yeah. And uh, like just a lot of the pre-Raphaelites. Um, Pre-Raphaelites, okay. Like uh, just that romanticized mm. Arthurian medieval sort of like 18th century, I think. Yeah. Century. 19th century um yeah like early 19th century Victorian or... illustrators and stuff like that and just like yeah. yeah the like sort of uh worship of the middle ages and and idealization of the middle ages yeah um, and Aubrey Beardsley was certainly among that Harry Clark actually came much later for me uh but actually resonates I think more with me than Beardsley got um, you like Beardsley did you know Lamort Arthur and all of these things and so his Arthurian work in particular is what I'm interested in mm -hmm. um, uh, and the sort of pseudo medieval Art Nouveau thing. Um, mm -hmm. And from there, plus H.J. Ford and he, he's a bona fide pre-Raphaelite as well, but primarily working with ink mm -hmm. um, and just like the clear sort of worship of the ornamentation and yeah uh, and stuff of the middle ages and it just that combining with uh already present interest in the middle ages just kind of uh yeah I, nice i feel like it's the muse for me and i, and I just yeah i uh i i, I kind of took some time to uh look into some things that kind of reminded me of some of your work hmm. um so these are a few of these are aubrey beardsley's um and i'm seeing some similarities in you know the hands um the the actual like uh the patterns in the dress obviously the treatment of the flat black with the yeah. the whites um just absolutely fucking fantastically creative and like uh, just like such such a good problem solving artist um to portray whatever it is that they wanted to portray in like a really uh, like, um, as the, I think it's the aesthetic, uh, they called it the aesthetic aestheticism or something like that, mm -hmm. where it's like more, it's pushing something more like interesting to the eye than it is having like a direct message for anything. But um, yeah, these illustrations are just are fantastic. And I, I, I love to see how much you've drawn from these works um in your own style uh in your own way <clears throat> um but yeah i just figured i'd show a few of these um uh, especially this i can i've seen this specific um like nod to these this uh this this night um sort of garb you know what i mean like this um these patterns and uh, this, I think I've actually seen this, like this heart sort of thing. What is that? Do you know? Uh, oh, it's, it's a part, it's just got a piece of uh, armor. I actually can't remember what it's called, but it's just like, it protects the, a, an empty space. Like, oh like yeah. You open and close your arm. There's like a, there's all sorts of different shapes of them, but often yeah. they have kind of like a heart shape. That's uh, fucking cool. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know about that. And now it makes sense. It's like when you get a tattoo in the pit right there in your fucking arm, it's like a very vulnerable spot. You know, there's a vein yeah. there, there's tendons and shit. That, that is a fucking good spot to have a guard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Holy shit. So then, yeah. And, and then, yeah, like you can, you can see, I'll pull up some of your work in a second so that people can kind of make the correlations here um, mm -hmm. and the connections, but um yeah the medieval style like some of the uh some of the ornate um aspects of some of your framing work um i wish i could pull up both on this at the same time um but what i can do is just uh you know what i can probably just present stop the screen present share the screen window and this one, share that screen, baby. All right. So this is a piece that Robin has made uh, for Devil Master. Um, and as you can see, you know, there are pieces of the armor that have that like patterning. Um, 
the hand treatment may be you know kind of similar to the beardsley stuff we were showing um do you want to talk about this piece a little bit sure um oh, yeah i feel like the way i go about i had a prompt from them i think they were just looking for some kind of like alaric vampiric sorceress figure that's sick um and i just have an obsession with this kind of uh that I mean that's my shit. So I uh I remember trying a few different things um and not really landing on anything, but I was out for a walk and this drawing kind of came to me. I was listening to some music. I think I was probably fucking stoned or something. <laughs> um which is something that I will often do when I'm trying to come up with what I when I'm in this process of like I guess designing um, what it is that I'm actually going to draw. I'll spend a lot of mm -hmm. time walking around and like marinating in a certain atmosphere. Yeah. And this drawing kind of, at least the composition of it, um, came to me almost fully formed, uh, mm -hmm. as far as like where the values were going to be and the general energy of it. I just wanted mm -hmm. something really intense and, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of, I feel like I'm repeatedly drawing the same character over and over again. Just some, like, dragon helm wearing, like, Shadow Knight. I mean, uh, dude, it's sick, though. Yeah, I <laughs> like, mean, I just... Nothing wrong with I, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's working. It seems to be working. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have much more to say about it other than... Yeah. Maybe you could ask me some stuff and then I can go into it more. I, I do actually have somewhere, and I just saw it in one of these sketchbooks that I've got here. Yeah, the I'll, uh, I'll zoom out and we can talk about, you know, whatever you want to show. I think I've got a thumbnail for this drawing somewhere. So you can see, like, my initial idea that just kind of appeared and then how close it was to the... Cheers, guys. Thanks for joining. Thanks for being a part of this. If you uh, if you want to give a comment and let let us know your name so I can know who you are. Sick, dude. That's like a nice little thumbnail that really shows the yeah, so the understanding of what you want out of the composition and what you want dark and what you want light. It's a nice yeah. little study there. <clears throat> yeah. Is that, um, is that like typical of your process? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I can't just start drawing on the paper. Like I will do at least one mm. thumbnail uh, or like studies for yeah. pretty much every drawing. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, a drawing will come out on paper, and it's kind of like an accident. Um, yeah. But I feel uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and that's kind of I mean I rely on on that in the sense that I don't want to spend too much time on like an underdrawing or on a thumbnail. It's like inherently quick. Mm -hmm. And so there is actually a lot of like, I mean, you have to have a certain like understanding, I guess, of what it is that you're trying to draw in order to blast something out like that. But right. just through, through it's, it's, I was actually talking about this with uh, a friend yesterday. We were talking about how it's much, much easier to iterate on something than it is to, come up with something out of nowhere oh dude i definitely feel that right yeah so so sometimes i'll like just brute force many thumbnails um because i can't like you know a deadline is approaching and i have to have something i have no ideas at all right and, uh i i maybe i'll have like you know i i know generally the subject and like what it is that i want but how it's going to actually go on the page and and how yeah. it's going to feel and stuff it's almost something that you know you draw a bunch of rectangles and you just fill them with bullshit until one kind of falls together and my it's almost like i'm receiving it like i i'm like oh that one is looking cool i can build off of this like this looks like it could be this and then you know i'll do a maybe a bigger more detailed version of it right next yeah. to the sketchbook and um from there i when i go to finally draw on the paper it's like there it is i'm just copying from my sketchbook a composition a fully a fully finished mm. composition generally 
Nice, dude. I mean, I can definitely relate. Um, when it comes to thinking of something out of my head, it's a little difficult sometimes when there's no super motivation there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, I know that there are artists out there that are making pieces and then just presenting them and having people go, oh, I'll buy that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But for me, I feel like a lot of the times that I make pieces, it's for a commission and there is some sort of artistic direction mm -hmm. or there's at least lyrics that I can go off of or um, like a, a concept or, you know, some sort of theme. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's important to sketch out some things, especially when it comes to figuring out where things are going to be in yeah. the piece itself you know the shapes starting with shapes and finding it and figuring out you know as far as value um that stuff is crucial and i probably do it about 50 percent of the time i make art <laughs> like doing a, a thumbnail before you like studies it. yeah i just like sometimes i'll just jump in and uh and yeah part of part like half the time i'm like yeah i really wish i hadn't done that and then the <laughs> other half it's like yeah it fucking worked out <laughs> it, yeah it's, it's kind of just one of those things where i th through just making shit for so long um yeah. and just realizing like pretty much any time it could, doesn't matter what it is for making music mm -hmm. or drawing or whatever if we do a pre-pro and we record stuff first and then we get to the chance to listen to it and look at it and critique mm -hmm. it the final version is going to be 10 times better and it's just like almost like a rule and so if i anytime i i'm in a rush and i don't do that stuff um i'll typically end up not very happy with the results yeah they'll just be it's like this is something that i could have noticed on the for on the you know during the studying phase yeah. and would have fixed but now it's a part of the finished piece and uh i don't know it it's still valuable in that I can apply it to the next drawing. And of course that's what yeah. I'm always doing. But um, it, when, when there's someone on the other end that's wanting or that's paying for it or whatever, I just feel, right. I mean, typically the client is more happy with the result than I am. That seems to be the way that it, that it always goes. I feel like any illustrator can relate to that, but. Uh, yeah, I feel, yeah, for sure. Like, you know, I think it's a the cliche about everyone's their own worst critic. It, it, I think it's like it's applied to an artist's psyche like tenfold. It's just whenever you make something, you're just looking at all the things that you could have done better and all this stuff. But then there's someone out there or especially the people that are commissioning you that are appreciating your work enough to want to work with you. And mm. chances are if you put you know your heart into it they're gonna fucking like it and you know obviously like you run the risk of like i don't know having someone just kind of say oh it looks great you know but like there's i think uh i'm particularly for you i have to say like your work is fucking stunning dude like thank you man it's 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 very um it's very well thought out and yeah, there's just a lot of smart decisions being made um, because it's easy to get dark and light have like, you know, it's easy to um, kind of make something dark that should be light. <laughs> it's easy to, you know, like not really anticipate it, especially like if you're already going into it with ink and you're like, what the fuck? Like, did I? want this black did i need this fully black yeah there's like all of these like things that run in your head when you're doing ink and like you know obviously there are ways to correct a mistake or whatever or change your mind um with uh different tools and things like that but it's never going to be the same as the white of the paper yeah you know what i mean it's just yeah. a different look which um just looking at your work i can see that a lot of things are just really like figured out and deliberate and just well executed and yeah it's it doesn't go unnoticed man like yeah it's rad that's so cool.
Um, yeah, I, uh, it's funny. My, I, my uh, best friend slash bandmate, Colby in Wormwich, uh, his wife is also a very close friend of mine. And mm -hmm. her name, uh, or Saren Horn on Instagram, she's a, an amazing painter and tattooer. And uh, she was doing art long before I like got back into drawing. And uh, I remember I have this like particular memory of one time being over at uh, Colby's place and she was there and I think we were jamming and she was drawing something and she had made a mistake and she said, think before you ink. <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, and that stuck with me for some reason. Um, I like it. But it's and now it's like I actually don't really want to think very much while I'm actually inking. Yeah. Um, I would like the process of inking to be mostly just filling in something that I've already decided. Um, in the in that process of uh, mm -hmm. uh, doing the studies and doing the thumbnails and figuring out the values and stuff. By the time I I'm actually inking. It's like, I already know kind of like, Oh, I'm just going to black out this whole area. And, yeah. uh, you know, whatever, this area will be bright. And then I'm going to use, I know that in the end, I'm going to use like my white pen to like add in like some minor details there. Yeah. Or, um, but uh, when I first started, I didn't do that at all. It was just, uh, I realized that if you make things really black, they look really good on a, on a white background. But then as soon as I started doing, like a scene yeah. or putting a figure in context, then I realized like, you know, I can't just make everything black. I have to think. And like, why am I, you know, uh, I'm thinking in terms of what am I, who's the main, uh, subject, like what's right. happening, um, in the piece and basic like rules, I guess that I have mostly inherited from, friends, artists and friends who have gone to school and actually have, a, have an actual education. <laughs> um, but like putting, say, the main subject in the area of the highest contrast um, mm. and various things like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, I feel like with your work, it's it's consistent that just black and white pray, play like like stark black and stark white play uh a significant role in in showing um your subject matter uh and it's it's just done so well um you can you know really uh decipher what is what i mean what is being emphasized and like what everything is there's no <laughs> for lack of a better term gray area i mean obviously there's <laughs> there's gray areas but like it's yeah. because of your hatching style and your treatment of patterns and yeah i just it's it's so fucking awesome to look at your work because there's so much to kind of take in um and obviously i'm just kind of running through these right now mm -hmm. um i want to definitely kind of go into you know, a little closer in and look at some things, but I figure I'll just, for the people that are checking this out to see just some examples of his work and maybe make that connection to Beardsley again, I can pull up some more stuff. I have of Harry Clark. I'd like to talk about Harry Clark for a minute too. Um, but yeah, dude, it's just, I feel like you've got like wood block technique in your inking. Like, are you using a nib or like what kind of tools are you using for this stuff? Uh, it's pretty much all just like micron pens. Nice. Um, uh, I've experimented a lot with like scale, like what scale I'm actually drawing something at. Um, oh, yeah. I uh, have run into issues where like, Initially, you know, the, the idea of doing a big drawing is really intimidating, especially when you're first getting into drawing. Mm. Um, and when you're looking at ink work, which is so meticulous and stuff, th I'm thinking like, if I make the drawing bigger, it will be more work. Um, and right. I actually found that to be not the case. Uh, it's actually okay. almost the same amount of work. Um, nice. <clears throat> because you still have to put it. I mean, it really depends. Like, for example, I mean, I've got some some things yes please uh, let's uh let's jump here. back to this um i recently did this 
piece, uh, which is going to be going into a, a uh, yes, like a RPG expansion for this game called Twelve Years by Max Moon Games, and I'm Sick. Ooh, everything's reversed on my phone. So, um, oh yeah, and so this is like really small, right? Like this part is was fucking small, and my hand was cramping up <laughs> through, throughout this this drawing. Um, and then I've got mm -hmm. other drawings. I mean, a lot of them I, I don't have here, but uh, I realized that, uh, I mean, for, in that case, it's mm -hmm. going in a small book, and I wanted to draw it at the actual scale that it was going to be. Right. Um, but I could have blown it up twice the size and just used a bigger pen, you know? Yeah. Like, um, like we have all these... You know, I don't need to use a 0 0.05 pen for fucking everything. And that's what I was doing when I started. I hear you, man, because yeah. you're limited. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, you can't go, you can't, you can't go as, like, you can't go smaller than 003 on a, yeah. when it comes to, uh, like, a micron or, you know, a liner. Yeah. Um, I, I prefer a Stadler liner or Stadler, however you say it. I call it Stadler. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I said Stadler. Uh, but yeah, like the liners are limiting if you start at a certain size for sure. Yeah. And now, I, how big are you making your artwork like comfortably right now? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I have any example. I mean, this is the 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 piece piece of paper like size that I will typically use now. And obviously, this is this was a border that was done for that crawl. Oh, um, hell yeah. And Nat, like, it, for example, you were showing that one with the two, uh, like, guys on horseback. Yes. Um, that was, like, that a full sheet of paper, basically. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hold on. I'll bring that up. I'm just so stoked that I can, like, show visuals now with this. This is, like, uh, a real game changer. <laughs> Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. So, yeah, that would have been, you know, about if people can see you know, me holding like the scale yeah. of my hand, you know, it's like quite large. Like, yeah, the, the the horse would be like larger than my hand. And I just found that it's it's. I mean, I'm I'm not using digital tools. Um, and if you're working digitally, you can sort of zoom in infinitely, and um, right, it's essentially achieving the same effect. If I just make the paper bigger and use bigger tools yes uh, i can use my arm when drawing more and bigger hand motions uh, oh yeah I'm yeah drawing, and more control like the, the because ultimately that's going to be on a record cover or it's going to be most people are going to see it on their fucking phone screen or something so it's going to be yeah. tiny. it looks really impressive but right. really it's just big enough so that it's easy <laughs> you know like yeah um, and so, I mean, like, so, okay, so uh, what was, who was this for? <clears throat> this is for, I uh, actually don't know how you pronounce it properly, but like, go to Werex or whatever. Go to Werex, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I uh, see the title here. Global. I wasn't sure if it was a typo. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a uh, Chinese black metal label. Cool. Um, and I think this was for... It's like a side project of Lamp of Murmur called Silent Thunder or something, and Silent Thunder Shadow Dungeon. And Shadow Dungeon, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I don't know if that's come out yet, but uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. This speaking of uh, like prompts or whatever. Yes. This, I had a super specific, the most specific, um, I guess, prompt that I've ever had. And I really struggled to come up with a composition for this one because it was like two undead ghoulish looking knights on horseback yeah, uh, with like a crazy asymmetrical castle in the background and they should be near the shoreline and there should be spiky rock formations and it should uh. be nighttime, but not, or not fully nighttime. It should be sort of like twilight and all of these things. And I was just like, Holy Fuck. um, so, uh, I mean, I like, all right, let's fucking do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you executed it so well, dude. I, I feel like I can see some Dore in your work, too. Oh, um, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Like, just your, 
just treatment of perspective the way that you are going about inking the lines um just definitely reminds me of like the wood block sort of technique yeah. um yeah. really smart uh vertical hatching here um I, I don't know if you can see my cursor easily but I and this see. is yeah just like going in with the little heavier lines but n so as not to like pull too much away from the foreground like that stuff i could get nerdy about this shit all day dude like mm. and well, yeah just your treatment of like curvature and shadow is just super smart i yeah i envy the ability to understand how to <laughs> do these things like <laughs> yeah i mean I, I think i mean i don't know uh I, I was going to say i mean that, that part of that is the beauty of working at a larger scale and mm -hmm. having you have much more flexibility with the tools that you're using so when i use because i use the 0 0.05 for the farthest away right uh, like nice. mountains and castle and stuff i think i might have yeah. used it for the nearer stuff but i just was working the lines a little bit more um mm -hmm. and just understanding like little rules like things that are further away are are going to be lighter and fainter typically uh and then like looking at oh this this guy's on the bright background so he's going to be dark and the other guy's right. on, on black so he's going to be yes. lighter um but also being like oh well i have a white horse here so i need to make the behind the horse dark but above the horse is lighter so it's like right you can see there's an abrupt transition like between the two horses there but um, oh yeah man like it's not always easy to figure out how to like problem solve like that or you know go about um making those decisions uh can just be like really difficult and enough to make people pull their hair out and scream and flip their desk over no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like that kind of thing is not something that you know comes easily all the time and i just feel mm. like you you did this so so well um yeah and and it's really interesting how like asymmetrical it is in one aspect and mm. symmetrical in another aspect um but it's still really it, it's balanced and i'm trying to zoom out but i think my computer's like it this these are very high resolution images and i also want to thank you for sending such high res Im images so we can really oh, see the detail um but yeah like let me see if i can just yeah there we go okay um but yeah like as far as your architectural uh your understanding of architecture i guess it probably goes back to the castle book that you showed us like yeah anything else that, that like, i feel like there's some gothic um influence in your architectural like execution um we want to talk about that a little bit <clears throat> um yeah i mean uh honestly fucking dark souls had, has had a huge influence on on me as well which i think it has had a huge influence on fucking everyone or it's just so so omnipresent uh in fantasy art these days but like right. the gothic stuff and like the prevalence of gothic architecture um mm -hmm. particularly in dark souls 3 uh like obviously that's or maybe not obviously but um that's something that's always interested me and uh i don't know there's just something very uh it links to a lot of like deep interests and like emotional connections that i have to mm -hmm. the middle ages and and like archaic perspectives and like what the who who was making these like structures and why and like yeah. so there's a lot of emotion there and there's this kind of uh intense longing for like eternity and heaven and and perfection and all of these things that mm -hmm. i think are kind of tragic um as much as they are kind of beautiful um mm. but uh, yeah <laughs> yeah i feel yeah. like um architecture is just it, it's it's 
some some things you just look at like buildings and you're just like holy fuck that was done by hand like yeah well yeah, I mean, it's like how much scale of you know man hours and like mm-hmm. uh devotion and like what was what was fueling that like a lot of like religious kind of ties into that stuff and like mm-hmm. yeah it, it's interesting i've never really thought about it that hard but like that you know the things that you mention about it like how it can be um both you know tragic and also um like inspiring um it's all inspiring um it's like the way that some buildings when you look at them how ornate things are on the edges of rooftops or you know on the tops of like castles and things like that like gargoyles and just like really intricate um parts of a building it's just yeah it's fucking incredible to look at yeah i mean all all that stuff had a purpose and like you right. know, the people that were making it like specifically with a you know cathedral and uh mm-hmm. that's a that's you know not necessarily the norm um uh, during the period but because it was such like um so many people from society came together to build them mm. there's so much of society represented in them and like all of their hopes and what the society itself looked like on a sort of mundane level and yeah uh, and you're you, these people are living in like a there is no factory mass produced shit everything is a bespoke handcrafted thing everything right. around you all the time and you think about the scale of of everything it's everything is um a bit smaller the people themselves are actually smaller mm-hmm. um and there's this kind of like fractal like down to the the smallest detail mm-hmm. um aspect to everything and now we have yeah. kind of, everything is so simplified and stuff so i don't know i'm just kind of mesmerized by that world that world of like wood and stone and metal and oh yeah no composite materials or glass or whatever yeah. it's uh, it was human sized and i don't know i feel this kind of intense uh interest in that and so nice. i'm constantly drawn to drawing it and kind of meditating on it in a way and uh but, but this piece in particular like obviously it's not like a cathedral or anything but mm-hmm. I, I particularly love castles and um like military castles like as soon as a castle has all the walls knocked out and windows put in i i lose interest <laughs> I'm, I'm interested <laughs> in like square castles built for military purposes they're like these imposing things obviously i mean square castles are earlier and then later they start to get rounder and they figure out uh-huh. all the different stuff but uh it's just cool it's kind of torn down is that what i'm seeing yeah so this is the same castle in the other piece uh it's supposed to be karn doom from the lord of the rings it's like the oh. of the witch king in the north right i have that piece here too i'd like to talk about that too because it's a stunning piece too um Okay, got you. So this is the after. Yeah, I imagine this was actually specifically commissioned by a black metal band called One of Nine. They're putting out. Uh, it should come out. I don't know, maybe next year or something. But right um, they oh, yeah. wanted One of Nine. Yeah, Carn Dumb. That's what I'm seeing on the. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> Carn Doom. But uh, Carn Doom. Yeah, <laughs> Carn yeah. Dumb, man. It's Carn. Uh, uh, it's car dumb, right? Bulky <laughs> nerd, so I'm gonna. <laughs> but uh, no, it's all good. It's all good. That's uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, fair. but yeah, uh, I I want to talk about this guy, dude. Holy shit! Like, sure. where is your influence coming? Uh, what what are you uh specifically like using influence wise when it comes to the treatment of that those clouds, that sky? Um honestly just nature around bc um and it's just something i'm constantly looking for and appreciating when i do see it and i'm really interested in like idealizing and worshiping nature 
uh -huh. in general with art and like presenting it at its most like sublime i guess um, oh yeah even in the context of darkness and and whatever i mean this is a triumphant image in that like yes. a fortress of evil that is in ruins and nature has kind of reclaimed it and is That's the sick. roots are growing through the ruins and stuff you know um, very cool <clears throat> And so just the the idea that in the first piece it's almost like a stormy sky and it's like mm -hmm. at that time the witch king is harrying the, the right uh, arnor and whatever and so it's like this menace of the north and mm -hmm. then to see that even this great power is like being destroyed yeah. and nature triumphs at the end um I, I guess really what I'm asking is, um, and, and I appreciate you going into that, but the treatment of the clouds, the, the actual technique of the pen technique that you're using, is there a specific artist that inspired that treatment uh, of the clouds? I couldn't say maybe a specific artist uh, mm. other than like just archaic or classic mm. art in general. Um, yeah. I, I'm not educated enough, honestly. Like, I just look at such huge amounts of art and I'm constantly yeah. kind of just archiving it. And, sure. um, and this is just like an amalgam of, yeah, I guess like an ideal, uh, I can't say the, I, I, I guess, uh, 18th century, 19th century classic art um yeah it's, it, i'm not trying to put you on the spot for like direct specifics i thought maybe yeah. if it was like a uh like one artist that really inspired you as far as their treatment of sky um i i feel like um i know we're jumping around a lot but it's actually really like cool to hear you kind of expound on whatever we got here and you Ooh. mentioned the witch king and i wanted to find that piece because I really love that piece. Uh, bear with me. There, here we go. Yeah, can you like talk about this? Because I just, yeah, it's super fucking sick. Um, yeah. Thank you, dude. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry, I'm prone to rambling on about. No, no, no. <laughs> this is you are the guest, homie. <laughs> cool. Um, this one, uh, I don't know. I I did a kind of um, fill in from Isolation Man, and Philip Hell reached out, and um, he wanted the Witch King, and I I love the Lord of the Rings films, uh, the mm -hmm. Peter Jackson films. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I love the the books, and primarily, and that's kind of. Uh, where i began but uh the films i think are as good as it could possibly have been ad ad uh, adapted uh -huh. and uh i love them but i i uh, get tired of seeing like the peter jackson representation of everything just over and over and over again um and I'm yeah. like, so i just wanted to I, I had i had a drawing in my sketchbook um because i'm constantly just drawing these like immortal fucking undead wraith knights and whatever and i had <laughs> yeah. this face sitting there and it's not in a style that i usually do but i just kind of liked it and i have these other kind of shadow knights in the past where i would have these super razor thin like evil looking eyes grinning out of these helmets but you wouldn't yeah. see the face and this is kind of what i was imagining is underneath there and uh this is supposed to be like a the the witch king in his mm -hmm. like spectral body like because his body's invisible normally so this would be like mm -hmm. what he actually looks like if you could see his body or like what frodo sees in like the wraith world um, got it hell yeah but uh i don't know when it comes to talking about like how i actually drew it i feel not super capable <laughs> i don't know like well, I, no 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 i mean it doesn't need to be you don't have to talk about how you drew it. I mean, I, I appreciate you just talking about it in general. Um, I feel like, you know, once again, you see the treatment of 
just the flat black with just simplistic patterning to suggest um you know this part of the armor mm -hmm. and yeah it's just i just love how you use black and white it's yeah i mean this fire is it comes off as fire um but what are uh is this like this kind of reminds me of like cerberus the three-headed dog but what is this uh what are these guys right here because i'm not um big into lord of the rings to the point where i know all the characters names and stuff i am definitely a fan of the uh you know the the general fucking ideas and and like the the imagery and it, I always like that stuff, but what what are those? I, I'm just curious. Um, it's the main request from Dylan was to get the Witch King swinging his big mace, and in Sick. in the films he has a flail. Um, okay. And so I was like, he wants the, the flails are cool, so let's go with the flail. It's not accurate, but uh, it's a reference to. So those aren't actually characters, but his Morgoth is like an ancient enemy like mm. predecessor of Sauron or whatever and mm. he had a mace that was called Grand okay. which I think it just I can't remember what it what it what it means something like fucking hammer of the underworld or some shit um, <laughs> and later on there was a uh they use like a battering ram in the battle for middle minister it and it's like a huge wolf's head and it's named grand after uh morgoth's hammer or his like mace um i think it's a hammer actually but uh i just the wolf heads and like the prevalence of evil giant wolves and shit like that in the lord of the rings it just felt like on theme for this character who mm. is like a captain of a captain of morgoth um so yeah that's all that is it's just a it's like s inaccurate to the actual book but it's still like an homage to the actual lore so i feel i felt like it was okay i like that though that's fucking cool that's creative license man like um you know not everything has to be literal when it comes to art direction that's the cool thing about an artist oh. representation of things just the rule um, say again the rule of cool <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm getting all sorts of quotables from you today <laughs> yeah. think before you ink yeah there you go that's how i <laughs> organize everything into small pithy rhyming things nice uh ken from uh ken's death metal crypt i don't know if you're familiar um but he nope. provides such fucking awesome uh he opens the 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 fucking the giant spike doors of death metal to the masses and shows all sorts of archived um old school death metal and new stuff you know he highlights oh, what yeah. he loves about it and he's got all this actual physical you know copies of things that he'll upload the images and upload the audio and he's he's an awesome dude and he just like keeps the death metal fire alive and uh i've learned a lot from him and he's 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 rad he's wondering uh, that was kind of a while ago, and I apologize. But he was wondering if, uh, well, first of all, he asked, what he really wants to know is what the last three albums you've been spinning. And mm -hmm. then he has another question. <laughs> uh, lately, I've been listening to this uh, band from the Netherlands called Turia a lot. Okay. Um, I can't remember what the name of the album is. Dagen von Licht or something. Um, okay. And uh, that band plus uh, recent Alpha from 2022. I can't remember the Alpha's name. Alpha's crazy good. Yeah. I really yeah. love that. And um, they put out uh, like two and... full fucking records in the same year. I don't know. I just, I, that was insane. Yeah, some guys are just nerds, dude. All they do is fucking make albums and. <laughs> I, wow. I can't do it. I can't do that. But uh, yeah, I spend, I spend so much time on. But also, um, what else? What else? Fucking uh, Ustawast. 
Um, I'm trying to think of music. Uh, honestly, I've been listening to a lot of Cadaver. You know, Cadaver. It's like a with you know, a like K a Swedish like stoner rock band. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's not yeah. really my my go to genre, but I can get down with a you know some stonery rock and roll kind of stuff. Yeah, I love yeah, rock and roll. Scorpion, Scorpions oh, slash yeah. uh, Thin Lizzy situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. lots of Thin Lizzy all the time. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. Um, a band called Rose Tattoo, which is like, more oh yeah, like the Black Rose. ACDC. Oh, okay, yeah, right on. Okay. Yeah, sick man. Um, yeah, I I noticed your Old Tower shirt too. I I I, I like to listen to them when I'm chilling, like you know, trying to wind down for the night. I really do enjoy um, the music that Old Tower puts out. Um, oh, yeah, do you have like a favorite album from them or anything like that? Um, I don't know if it's a favorite, but I have the last Eidolon on CD and for a while I, it was like the only CD I had in my truck and I didn't have access to, to, I couldn't do like the Bluetooth thing or whatever in my truck. Sure. And so I just had this fucking old tower CD and I was working before I quit my job to do drawing full time. I was working at night for my father's yeah. job, just like cleaning yeah. degrees and shit. And I was always driving home at like. 4 a.m. blasting right. that record in my truck, like nice. window open, like just under the fucking night sky. Oh hell and yeah! I, uh, I love that record, and honestly, I listen to primarily like dark ambient and dungeon synth stuff when I'm drawing. Uh, That's just, just really cool. The the atmosphere that I'm trying to tap into all the time. That makes total sense. Um, yeah, and I actually I haven't listened to dungeon synth while doing like any drawing so i'm gonna definitely do that sometime <laughs> soon because i do like things that you know you can get lost in your artwork with it being on and give you that atmosphere without it being too overwhelming and too much to pay attention to yeah so yeah, it yeah. Puts me, i like to like go into the world that i'm drawing yeah i feel like i'm just channeling it out and anything that i can do to like turn up the volume on the on that place yeah uh, so i can be there more fully it's like easier to to pull it out and put it onto a, into a drawing yeah for yeah. sure sometimes i find myself drawing in silence i totally forgot to like put something on and like that's kind of a trip when you actually when you take the second and go oh fuck i've been sitting here and complete <laughs> You know, like the sometimes. absence of audio. Yeah. Uh, that <laughs> just sometimes like you need it. Pure, pure concentration. Um, but, uh, Fucking yeah. Satori. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just like tunnel vision. Um, but yeah. Okay. So I did tell everybody that there would be a Q&A section um, of this broadcast. So I am getting people, uh, I'm, briefing them and letting them know that they can get their questions ready now um, so that we're not, you know, going too far to the end with them. Um, uh, let's see. Nameless Mist, a uh, uh, cool artist I uh, met on Instagram. Um, he said, amazing work. My question would be, what kind of white ink pen do you use? Which is a good question because I'm oh, curious sure myself. <clears throat> And then, Ken, we'll get to your second question, man. Uh, I just literally use these. I, I don't know if it's, like, what I want to I use, love but, but they fucking work for now. Yes, yeah, sir. And, uh, I have also in the past used um, a very, very fine, like, detailed brush and white paint. Okay. Um, what kind of you paint? Can get, you can get more, more control and more interesting lines with like a super fucking fine detail paintbrush. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, typically I'm using this. And yeah. This is like a zero eight and it just, mm -hmm. like, just does the trick. It's kind of like you have to, it's not going to give you perfect lines and it's kind of unwieldy. I mean, you clearly you use it, but I do for, for, for people that are listening, like it, it you kind of, if you fight it because you want a specific line from it, you're not going to get that. I feel like yep. it, allowing it to just kind of do what it does and 
sometimes it looks really cool when it's kind of like an imperfect line and it's yeah you know it's the inks it can be kind of a pain in the ass to get the ink going out you kind of have to get yes. it flowing first but yeah, sometimes i, have I like use that piece of paper separate just yeah. full of little spirally totally <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean to get it um, but, started again but sometimes mm -hmm. using it dry you can get like interesting like really faint uh little white lines and details and interesting. stuff interesting um, so yeah they work and yeah you and you use all three sizes uh i honestly just have this 08 and it's what i use pretty much for everything um, really i use it really sparingly like if i mm. it, it's i use it to clean up little things here and there and then there'll be some times where i I'm like, I want one solid line going yep. through this and I'm not, I'm just going to black out the whole thing because it's faster and then put the line in after. I used to just meticulously leave the white space everywhere and oh, yeah. it's fucking ages. It's uh, difficult, yeah. man. It is, yeah. it, I've always struggled with that kind of thing. And I, uh, when I found jelly rolls, I was like, uh-huh yep this yeah. is like the answer to a lot of my frustrations yeah. um but i think like some people find that they don't like how they lay down and i i understand what you mean about not fighting it because yeah, yeah like sometimes it'll have this weird double line situation for all yeah. artists that use this they'll know what i'm talking about yeah. you have to kind of just get it started again and then just not press as hard but you have yeah. to like you know what I mean? And the cool thing is that you can ink over, like, back over it when it's dry, which it dries really quickly, too. True. Um, it's just always been one of my favorite tools at this point um, for the past few years. So, yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> so we've got, let's see. Um, Ken asked, uh, if you could do art for any band album, what would it be? Who would it be? Hmm. That's a big question to answer on the fly, but for any band, yeah. Take a second to think about it, and I'll kind of go through some of your art. And uh... Uh, if Ustalost puts out another record, I'll I'd do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's like a, a Will Scarstad, I think, from Yellow Eyes. Like, oh, so cool, the, dude! The projects. Um, yeah, man. I feel like those that like. I feel like there's um there's Vanum, Yellow Eyes, uh, um, Ash Borer. All yeah. those guys are kind of like in with each other, making music in New York City, right? Uh, or is it someone else outside of that? I can't remember. Uh, I recently did a show with the guys in Predatory Light, and they're also cool. In some of them are in Phantom, and I can't yeah. remember where they're from. Are they East Coast? I I can't remember. So maybe yeah. I I do know that. What was that uh, House of First Light? That label uh, that seems to connect a lot of that stuff. And uh -huh. the guy, I think he I think he died recently. Rest in peace. But uh, uh, yeah, that, that whole like. I love all that shit. A lot. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I I dip my toes in uh, some black metal every once in a while. I'm mostly into death metal and death doom and things like that. But mm. um, one of my favorite black metal records is Aesoth, Arrow in the Heart. Oh yeah, I know that record. So yeah, cool fucking record. good. That yeah, shine kind of makes like that full record thing going on as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the art is great too. The artwork is yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so can we talk about Harry Clark? Yeah, sure. I'm definitely this... not an expert, but uh... no, no, no. Dude. Well, yeah, but who cares? Like, I'm not here yeah. to ask you about expert shit. I'm sure. just, uh, you know, Timer. I like to nerd out about stuff, you know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I just, uh, I, I'm just gonna pop this on and just kind of show some things that i see that might be kind of like direct correlations to your artwork in in harry clark's work too yep. um again with you know uh smart black um decisions and patterning mm -hmm. um a lot of you know like higher detailed patterns and ornate 
um, qualities. Um, obviously, like the morbid tinge to things, um, but also, uh, you know, as far as your treatment of certain textures and things like that, I feel like there's a correlation there. Um, let me pull up the other screen real quick. Sure. And man, I am just so stoked on how much I can do with this program. I want to shout out um, Lee uh, for uh, a friend of mine uh, who also does artist interviews uh, for showing me this um, this uh, streaming site. It's very cool. <clears throat> Here we go. All right. So that's Beardsley. And this is also Beardsley. Yeah, once again, just to point out, like just some of the 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 things you'll see on the um, the armor, like mm -hmm. the the extra um, little bits about you know the details as far as what's on the armor and where and things like that. You can see in your work, and it's it's really cool mm -hmm. carrying that torch, man. But all right, so yeah, here's Harry Clark, which. He's definitely one of my favorite artists. Um, he, uh, prominent, uh, he was prominent in the 1920s for, um, I think specifically my favorite stuff he's done, I think probably for a lot of other people that are into like darker shit, um, is all of the uh, Edgar Allan Poe stuff. Um, yeah. And, you know, like you've got just so many interesting ways of separating um, figures from background, uh, you know, landscape stuff, um, patterning and clothing. Um, and just by simple things like white lines here to express mm -hmm. like, here's a highlight of this gown, this like, you know, this outfit this person is wearing and like, you know, obviously you've got like these drips happening. Like that's a big influence. You know what I mean? From all the way back then, this is like one of my favorite pieces, just how smart it is to have just this one thing of white to show yeah. that there's utter darkness around this one part of a light opening. You know what I mean? um the crop work and things like that but i see these themes in your work too I, I i see that you use the whites and the blacks to your advantage to show certain things i wish i had i wish i had the ability to like show them side by side but um but yeah like you know just uh the patterning in in different um things of clothing and like textures you can definitely see in your work and uh, I really appreciate it. I love when people, like I said, like carry that torch from from the greats mm -hmm. from uh, the past and put it into their work that exists in this, especially in heavy metal, especially like, you know, um, expression for rad extreme underground music. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like again, you know, just this solid black just filling the space and and you know okay that's hair you know what i mean like he didn't even bother to put any white highlights in that it's just like it's just it's bold it's a bold decision you know what i mean um but yeah i don't know i just figured i'd bring it in and and just kind of show because i think that people can see that that connection to some of your stuff um that's and awesome. i really appreciate it so yeah, I uh, I definitely have taken a lot of influence just in the like terms of I think it's very easy when when you start drawing to think that you have to represent everything sort of accurately. Right. And there's this kind of like naivety to this the Art Nouveau stuff where it's mm -hmm. just like fuck that like this it's representational like you know exactly. we're, we're not looking at 
a act an actual drawing of a building or a room but right. there's like subtle details there that say that it's inside somewhere or whatever and like we know that it's a robe and all we care about is that it looks beautiful not that it yes. is realistic or whatever yeah and, and like noticing like you're pointing out the black hair and stuff i'm mm -hmm. looking at it and i'm thinking like well there's this great like gradient of value from like the white of her dress to like mm -hmm. the you know black and white like on the left side there oh yeah um, absolutely and then to the dark black and then back to the white and it's like if you had put details in the hair there it would totally wash out that area and you would lose yes. the dress you know mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. it's like there's certain things that it just it's so simple to just do less you know like you don't have to not right. everything needs to be fully rendered all the way and and exactly. it doesn't if it's rendered at all it doesn't need to be rendered with a particular perspective i mean it get it depends on what it is that you're trying to do really but yes. if, you're, if you're just trying to make a beautiful piece of art that has amazing contrast and like this is using all kinds of like compositional devices to tell you like who's the most important figure and mm -hmm. and like there's a story happening there and right uh, there's all this like movement through the through the piece that you can see um yeah it's it's i i think like especially like for its time it's just incredible like the the combination of you know like you've got these like monsters with like what is that a cat head and a and a human zombie like these things were probably so uh jarring for the audiences that you know found these these pieces of artwork like just incredible representations of whatever you know stories were being illustrated for Edgar Allan Poe mm -hmm. and um yeah it's just just some of these things you see in work like this and it's just being carried into newer pieces like yourself like like the uh, artwork that you do um is just so cool to me you know so i'll stop nerding out about these these um these pieces but yeah it's just those oh. decisions that are just super smart <clears throat> oh that's cool i think it's interesting i mean looking at what people in the past were drawing and, mm -hmm. and i mean what's present in all of the tales and stuff at the time it's actually like i find that so much of the most bizarre interesting shit is old and yes. i find a lot of new stuff to be very sanitized and boring and like self referencing yes. i mean everything's always referencing something else like originality doesn't yes it? yeah um but, at this uh, point <laughs> yeah. but uh yeah like as far as like bizarre monsters and a complete disregard for reality and 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 also like being so close to to mythology and the world generally being more superstitious the further back you go right um, it just results in absolutely surreal shit that you know we look at it now we're like oh man it, actually, yeah. like it was almost more normal then than <laughs> than now <laughs> um so i pulled up this other piece that you made for full of hell mm. and i wondered if you could talk about that a little bit sure uh, is there anything in particular that you are interested in knowing about it or just yeah um well so i'm wondering where the influence for these creatures faces and like eyes like these um these this kind of dragon creature is mm -hmm. coming from um is this from a specific like folklore or is this lord of the rings again is this something i should know i mean i would like to no. know uh there's like a particular drawing i actually don't know who the artist is of like mm -hmm. a dragon just in i think it might be like a beowulf illustration or something um, yeah of a dragon blasting in a very similar position with these bulging eyes and and whatever Sick. and it's uh I'm pretty sure it's Beowulf like holding up his shield and like deflecting the flames. Um, mm. I, I can't remember exactly what Wolfhell asked for for this uh, piece, but I kind of just, I think they wanted a dragon. 
And I was like, I'm just going to draw a dragon fucking incinerating a dude in his own armor. Um, yeah, I, the, tr the fire is so fucking cool to look at. Like, I don't feel like I've ever seen fire uh, represented like that. Like I would, coming out of a mouth like that is that coming from a specific influence or? Uh, it's a Balrog illustration by Ian Miller. Nice. Um, that it, there's a particular one, and just the way that he, Ian Miller is another great example of a uh, of an artist that touches on kind of stuff that we were talking about with yeah like, arc and whatever, where it's like not. There's there's a naivety, there's a complete disregard for like classic art. It's like low brow, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, but at the same time, it's full of all these really interesting, like uh, vaguely psychedelic patterns right. and and things. And uh, honestly, so, I really struggled with this fire. I remember like mm -hmm. fucking bashing my head and just trying to figure out how the fuck I was going to draw this. Uh, and I. I remember kind of just eventually I had to just commit to it and just like see yeah. how it turned out. And yeah, it's like, it's definitely you've got some line going on and then you've got, you've decided to get some flames just black. I think it's cool though, man. It's like. Something it, I'm always looking for is like readability mm -hmm. from if, if the drawing is like small or far away. Um, yeah, and so it's not like I don't know all the theory necessarily, but I'm just kind of looking for if I just squint my eyes and I yep. can still tell generally what it is, then, right? Uh, then I'm doing a good job, I guess. Um, yeah, so you absolutely can see that it's just... fire. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry, I said you absolutely can see that it's fire with a smaller in a, as a smaller image. You yeah. can definitely tell what's what's happening here. Yeah. Um, so so. I, I, a lot of dis, those decisions are not something that I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make the fire white and black here. It's kind of just like I want it to read. And so it's like a pragmatic decision almost, mm -hmm. not, not necessarily a creative one. Got and it. Then, and then just like I'm going to see what the result is and experience the result as it mm. kind of happens and yeah sometimes i don't like it <laughs> but uh yeah well yeah like we said like you know there's just certain things that we might not appreciate after making it but people that are looking at it really can yeah. and i do um i, I like how you chose not to do fire right here because it would have just been really complicating with the snakes and yeah yeah exactly. um, i figured like uh, it's that's where a bunch of I don't know it if it just reads and then that's good enough for me eventually. Yeah, it's it's definitely important for areas to breathe in artwork and um, like knowing what what can be uh, exacerbated or like shown way more ornately, and then mm -hmm. things that need to be like toned down or just completely one color or one value just because of how busy and muddy it, it has potential to be mm -hmm. um but yeah like you really you have a, a a good understanding of what to do and what not to do to get your pieces to show everything and get it all across as what they are thank you um, man really encouraging really cool. thank you yeah absolutely um do you have any questions so far for me or anything like that i don't want to just make you talk a million words <laughs> uh, i don't know i don't have any particular questions i'm kind of just going with the flow here i don't know if you, cool you have yeah same questions. i mean yeah we're we're kind of just Jumping around. Hey, it's Mark Riddick. He's on here. Hell yeah. yes. Fucking A. Mark, welcome to the party, sir. I'm uh, really stoked to be doing this on YouTube with visuals. Uh, Mark was a uh, he was a huge supporter of my um, first uh, 
iteration of Form Terror Fridays. Oh, and yeah. uh, he would just be there every time to see whoever artist I was talking to, to ask really awesome questions and be engaging. And it was just, it was very fulfilling and, and uh, like quite honorable. Um, and then, uh, or you know, I felt quite honored. And then I had the, um, the, also I had the honor to talk to him and do one with him. And then we actually ended up doing a, a second one. Okay. So he's, uh, I, I love, you know, how passionate he is about art and, um, and he, he's definitely always, um, it's always nice to know that he's in support of what I'm doing and, and, and what, you know, as far as educating slash inspiring artists and, or people that are into art, um, about what's going on behind the curtain, you know? Mm. Um, uh, so I think I actually saw, I don't, I didn't see the whole episode, but, uh, my girlfriend was, was listening to one and I was kind of, uh, overhearing and so nice. there was a lot of interesting stuff there, but I didn't, I don't know which yeah. one of the two it was, but, uh, it's, I've been tended to go back and check it out because it's just full. Right. Of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Bullshit. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of, of Mark's work and have been for a while. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, it's great to see you on here, man. Um, yeah, he's, yeah, he was talking about pre-Raphaelites earlier. Um, Definitely. and he asked any favorites from that era. Um, I feel like they're kind of top of the pile, but like Waterhouse, um, and H.J. Ford would be like the only ones that I'm really aware of but they have mm -hmm. uh there's just a lot of work particularly hj ford um yeah and i i don't know if he's typically considered a pre-raphaelite but he was contemporary with them and i think was working with them i'm i'm again not an expert on that but uh you know but uh yeah i just love the idealization of the middle ages and that particular thing it's just, just weird mm -hmm. dream world uh Hell yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, I will, I, I like, I don't know much about pre Raphaelites, so I'm going to dive in and see what, what I can learn about that after having this conversation, because I feel like in school, uh, for art, it was, it was brushed over or I didn't like give it as much. I mean, like, Romanticism, I feel like uh, one painter that stuck out to me as far as um, that in that um, that time period that, you know, they considered romanticism, um, Casper David Friedrich. I'm not familiar. OK, he did. Um, I believe it was oil paintings uh, as a German artist, and he did a painting called Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, which okay. also went to uh be the title of a, a wolves in the throne room song oh shit um yeah but um casper david friedrich did that very um re uh recognizable painting of a dilapidated church um with scraggly trees oh I know. that's been on like yeah. 10 different black metal albums more than 10 i think <laughs> mythic has it on their uh, uh, art uh cover art um i'm not sure if you're familiar with, with the uh death doom band mythic from pittsburgh they were like the pre uh they were like the band before derkata the death okay. doom band really sick shit but yeah, it's just so funny. Like it comes full circle. I really loved that painting. And then I was like, oh, look, it's on like all of these fucking. <laughs> yeah. like, oh. <laughs> that, oh, so Waterhouse, speaking of pre-Raphaelites and Wormwood uh -huh. and fans and whatever, that cover yeah. of Heaven That Dwells Within is The Lady of Shalott by William Waterhouse. Um, and okay. that's like a sort of platonic ideal of like pre-Raphaelite Arthurian painting. I, I feel like it's tragic and kind of realistic but definitely idealized and just the, let's or, see super ornate and attention gonna just straight up pop onto uh a window with the internet <laughs> which is cool too that i can do this 
I'll just do this window here. And uh, and you were saying Waterhouse, what did you say the imagery was? The piece? The Lady of Shalott. I think it's like... Sometimes they have like pieces underneath. Yeah. That one, first one. Oh, the very first one? Yeah, like with the lady in the boat. Oh, this yeah. one under here? Yeah. Got it. Let's see if we can make it bigger. This is the Wikipedia. Uh, there we go. All right. Yeah, I love that shit. It's like, and it, the story of this piece is that she is like going on this boat because of her unrequited love for Lancelot and then she dies or something. So she's about to like die essentially in this painting. Oh, that's tragic. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of symbolism in there. I, I mm -hmm. but, uh, and there's just something about it it's super immersive and you know uh yeah i don't know one of my favorite paintings wow look at that there's like a whole story on this quilt here yes yeah i love that I, that's something that i i love to do with my stuff and why i'm studying a lot of archaic art is so that even if the art that i'm doing is not necessarily archaic mm -hmm. i can include like archaic motifs or or yep. shape language or whatever in it um just as a kind of homage to to that stuff right well that's cool man um i yeah i, I i'm glad i was able to pull that up too because and i actually i might pull up ian miller too in a second but um oh yeah riddick's got another question here um what inspired your signature is that what I'm seeing in the bottom right corner? And I guess he was maybe referring to the piece with uh, the knight stabbing another knight. Um, oh, yeah. It's just like a bind rune. I don't know. I messed, messed around with my initials trying to find something that that looked appealing and that I could put everywhere. And I, I love, uh, you know, like Durr the way he oh, yeah. would, would in, in, engrave his like initials into the piece and i was looking for something that evoked that and then including the like kind of sigil-esque like yes. cross um yeah it's it just feels medieval and archaic to me that's it hell yeah uh, at, at um, the same time, including the kind of like i don't know just old weird shit yes basically Definitely see that. I feel like there's a little bit of a Durr influence in some of the demon faces that you do. And like, mm -hmm. um, definitely like kind of feels like there's a little bit of a pull from like the biblical demonic side of the like biblical imagery too. Yeah. Medieval, uh, especially late medieval paintings like uh, Bruegel or painters like Bruegel and and even like uh, Botticelli and stuff like that uh, mm -hmm. and their paintings of demons and and particularly from the Christian perspective um, or Catholic perspective I guess um, they're just so fucking weird there's faces and mouths and wings everywhere and yes. it's, a mix, it's a mix of reptilian mammalian <laughs> uh, like birds and there's what just no, no sense to it at all and I'd right. Say. What would you um, want me to look up right now, if you could? Like, I, I was thinking of Al Albrecht's, um like demon stuff, uh, uh, stuff like this. Oh yeah, yeah. This exact piece is something that I've referenced a lot, um, and I mean, this is typical of of a lot of the like demonic figures that you'll find in throughout mm -hmm. uh, christian art from from this period and it's like it's so i don't know there's something so weird about it you know like yeah, you, won't, you won't see these these kinds of figures or at least for a while they weren't as present in fantasy art oh, yeah. my primary my primary like interest is fantasy art like mm -hmm. D and d and shit yeah and I, I got tired of the like blizzard of blizzardification of art and fantasy right. art yeah and like pauldron core like 
Cauldron Core. <laughs> Cauldron Core. But um, it's fucking funny. <laughs> I just, uh, dude. <laughs> Uh, I just there a vacation, like, <laughs> and I wanted to see. Uh, I just wanted to see this weird stuff that I felt like yeah. I'm tired of just like green skins over and over again. Yes, you know, like um, give me like bizarre proboscis faced like shrimp demons. Yes, <laughs> all day. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, that face that you have um in the belly of that king that's sitting on the throne for oh, the yeah. let me uh let me pull that up i'm just jumping all around here guys that's cool. you're just gonna have to deal with it that's the way my <laughs> mind works at all times so i'm completely <laughs> all right let's see stop this screen um oh cool eric wolf salston is on here um oh, dude fuck yeah uh, incredible artist. Did you have any trepidations releasing art under a moniker versus your actual name? And do you ever fear outgrowing the brand yes. or feeling limited to limited by it? Uh, yeah, I thought about that a lot. And the thing is that I actually didn't intend for Mystic Barbarism to be like the name of my art at all. Uh, uh -huh. It was just my Instagram handle, and I started. Right. I switched from like a personal Instagram to uploading my drawings now and then, and then a few of them kind of took off. And by that point it was like, well, this is already my name and I'm not going to change it. So mm -hmm. it's what it is and I don't hate it. So it's cool. People, it seems do, people I, seem to like it. So yeah, kinda... it's rad. It is. It sticks out. Um, it's cool to say it sounds sick. Cool. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, yeah. I have quite literally thought about like, oh, maybe like I should start a new Instagram and and, do that. and uh, <laughs> make it like Robin B. Harris and like nah. I'll make Mystic Barbarism like maybe some kind of project and, you know, but I feel like I just when I get credited on stuff, I specify to credit me as Robin as much as my name. And, yeah. uh, you know, um, I don't feel any these days i don't really care very much I, I i i guess it's it's a part of it now like that's my website and and whatever right. but at the end of the day it's like i don't know i i don't i'm not worried about it as much anymore but there was a time where i where i thought about it too much and then i was like fuck this like it doesn't really matter um there's so many artists that i that i like early on a huge influence on me was sin eater um if you're aware of that illustrator say again the Sin eater it's like an english fellow he did a bunch of stuff he did a cover for fuck i can't remember what the band was but skeleton witch or some shit that might have been oh, later fuck yeah. but um but i was just seeing him a, a lot uh and there was another illustrator called cloven hoof that i was a big fan oh, of oh dude um Crap. i also inherited like interest from friends around me and stuff like that i benefit mm -hmm. from having friends with good taste so <laughs> <laughs> totally but, dude. Uh, a lot of inspiration out there yeah on that but, internet. but they all were using monikers you know oh um, sin eater sorry i just didn't hear what you said i'm sorry oh yeah yeah um, i've heard yeah sin eater, sin eater is awesome <clears throat> yeah and i just kind of was looking at them and and i don't know like i understand that they have a name and they put their name on the on their on their stuff and i i know mm. that that's them and it's just kind of like a circumstantial thing i feel like at this point i'm seeing this question now from from eric yeah eric uh was just commenting on after you said about your name um yeah it's I, just yeah total paralysis and changed my mind so often so the idea of sticking to a moniker terrified me <laughs> dude you can never go wrong with just your own name like it's never going to go out of style uh, I totally understand and relate. I I used to be that way with fucking everything, like mm. uh, my like PlayStation handle, my character name in World of Warcraft, my whatever. Like I don't like my character's name. I'm gonna delete them and start over. <laughs> you know, like yeah. Um, and eventually, I was just like, I I don't know. There's 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 so many names out there. Uh, eventually, I just kind of had to say fuck it and stop worrying about it.
but uh, I completely relate. Uh, it's interesting you asked that. <laughs> right on. Thank you for the questions, Eric. Uh, especially also, thank you, uh, Riddick, for asking some questions. Anybody else have any questions? <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna keep highlighting these. <laughs> That's fucking funny. That's funny. Are you yeah. influenced from Warhammer too? Um, I kind of just through proximity. I haven't yeah. played Warhammer uh properly, really. Mm -hmm. Um, I mostly come from like D D world yeah. when it comes to tabletop stuff um yeah. and obviously i mean i played warcraft which is just a rip off of warhammer anyway and uh you know i mean they're all rip offs of something else somewhere along the line but uh <laughs> uh yeah I, I i have a lot of buddies that are really into warhammer and i definitely i mean i take influence from it by way of ian miller and uh uh who's that other fucking illustrator I'm going to pull up Ian Miller because we talked about him several times now. Robert Blanche, I believe his name is. Um, at least it's Blanche. I don't know what his, what his first name is. Uh, names and stuff like that just fucking bounce off my brain. It's horrible. All good, dude. No worries whatsoever. Um, yeah, it's like sometimes it's just there's just so much stuff to remember and it's not easy. Um but it sounds like, I mean, I definitely can see, you know, any, I feel like anything medieval, anything that has to do with like war and like old weaponry feels like it would be something that was influential to your style, to your work. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, like who doesn't fucking love like old school weaponry, man? Like, do you have like books on that and stuff? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any specific ones you'd recommend? Um, I don't know how yeah, you require. Mm -hmm. I have I have some books. I'm trying to see if I, they're within reach. If I can see them. Right on. Uh, uh, while you're looking, I'll just say, yeah, Ian Miller is fucking incredible. He's done, I think, I, pretty much everything for uh, for uh, Ulthar, and it's just so fucking crazy looking like yeah you can yeah. see the Durr like demon-esque uh qualities in his work um and you know obviously you can see all sorts of other like uh it looks like some Virgil Finlay treatment here hmm. um I'm not sure if you're familiar with him but I talk no. about him like every time I do form terror fry <laughs> no no I'm, I'm not familiar you're not familiar no oh I would definitely uh, uh I'll, I'll send you well I could actually pull it up Oh, the internet is so wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, Virgil Finlay is one of my biggest inspirations. Like, he's not a direct influence, um, unlike uh, someone like the creep from Six Feet Deep. Um, uh, my buddy Tyler Pennington, who is just, he is literally like the living embodiment of his design, like, it's, it, I'm not going to say it's just that, but I'm saying he's really honed his craft and like brought Virgil Finley back to life, if you will. Um, but here, I'll just show you some Virgil Finley. He was also prominent in the 20s. Okay. Um, he did stuff for, uh, for HP uh, Lovecraft. Um, just incredible. Um, attention to detail um really he was pulling a lot from like harry clark and aubrey beardsley i think too like just really smart with mm -hmm. his black and white um mm -hmm. uh yeah dude yeah it's just incredible a lot of a uh, clay board a lot of scratch board uh stuff yeah. with you know pen and ink and then scratching away at it yeah um That's just cool. so far ahead of his time like some really cool morbid imagery too. He would do stuff for weird tales and mm -hmm. like creeps and all sorts of, you know, eerie and yeah, it's fucking awesome. Um, I have cool. several books of his, but yeah, we're totally jumping all over the place right now. I apologize. Um, 
think it's cool. Let's see that weaponry book. Oh yeah, I have this. Um, oh, which yeah, I cool. inherited from mm -hmm. a friend. Um, and it's just fucking full of. Uh, uh, there's a particular page that I like. Mm. Just saw it. Shit like this, you know. Yeah. Sweet. There it, it is, just, guys. It starts like early uh, with like kind of ancient stuff. Oh, sick, dude. And, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I I definitely felt like this is exactly what you had in your in your library. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, and cool. I've, I've been like looking into armor and just a general interest in the Middle Ages, like outside of art. Um, yeah. And uh, just for the sake of accuracy, honestly, like I'm a GM as well for D for D and D, and so I'm constantly like looking nice. for obscure historical shit that I can somehow insert into my D, D games and yeah yeah just like knowing like i know armor better than i know like anatomy you know so often how like awesome. i'll uh i'll i'll use that as a crutch sometimes because i'm like i'm not gonna draw body i'm gonna draw a suit of armor because i know how it works but as as a crutch in one aspect is a strength in another because how many artists out there are drawing armor as much as you are not a lot, man. Like, I don't know. When it comes to, <laughs> like... when it comes to like, like you know, like I'm saying, like predominantly, like a uh, common theme, you don't see a lot of like just armor. There's like you know warhead art, like we'll do like you know weaponry and and armor and stuff like that. But it's like there's really not as many. So that's something I think is to be appreciated about your um your subject matter you're just you know yeah. your artwork in general <clears throat> i i something that i've been noticing uh is that there seems to be like a fucking fanatical cult of like armor worshiping people on on instagram and i definitely there's a certain kind of like armor that is sort of reduced and realistic in that it's functional, but there's like certain armor motifs that I'm, I don't know, I've been seeing it a lot recently. So a, a, a huge thing that I've been experiencing a lot with, with drawing recently is mm -hmm. noticing that my ideas, like there's a lot of people out there that are aimed at and worshiping the same things that, that I'm worshiping, especially when, and, and Sometimes I'll like find an artist and I'm blanking on literally every name that I could possibly bring up right now, but, um, no worries. and I'm like, shit, we are looking at the same references and we are interested in the same fancy. And I can tell just because of the, the little things that you're putting on this helmet and the proportions of it and all of yeah. this stuff. Like, um, so there's definitely like a thing out there and I, I wouldn't claim to, to be like a master of it or at, at by any means, but, uh, I, yeah, definitely love drawing hard. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah, right on. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, there's going to be people out there doing similar stuff, but no one's, you know, everyone's uniquely them. And your unique style uh, is fucking sick. I don't know this other artist, so. I, I think uh, I think the main thing is just that, like, if you really love something, it's just if your shit's authentic and you really actually care about it, that's mm -hmm. the only thing that matters. I don't think it matters if it's new or no. unique at all. I think yeah. it only matters that you actually really care about it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think like inauthenticity reeks and you can tell. Um, and and when you when I look out there and I and I follow a lot of other illustrators and, mm -hmm. and see stuff and there used to be a part of me that would see that and become jealous or competitive or like fuck they're doing the thing that i was going to do or that i wanted to do or whatever or they're doing it better than me or and then realizing over the years and just over the years of making stuff in general and being contemporary with or being peers with other people that are making shit is that mm -hmm. like we're all just searching after something and uh, as long as you are honest about that 
mm -hmm. about what you actually are interested in, then I feel like the end result just kind of takes care of itself. Yes. And uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that those are great. Uh, that's a great sentiment. I completely agree. And the, uh, the inauthenticity um, thing that you, you mentioned is, is definitely um, apparent in your, in your work. You can see that you care about mm -hmm. what you are creating and you can see that you have the passion for the subject matter. Like, that's why I'm not like, that's why in asking these questions, it's like, I'm not surprised you have a book on weaponry. I'm yeah. not surprised you have, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not surprised that you are into Lord of the Rings or have medieval castle books. You know what I mean? It just makes total sense. And you can see that even before like having this interview, I was like, yeah, I'm totally, I can't wait to see like what kind of stuff like influenced this work. Um, so that's really cool. And uh, yeah, as far as authenticity goes, man, like, yeah, you're the fucking, you're the, you're the real deal. <laughs> uh, shucks. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, I can say the same for, for your work and so many of, a lot of the artists that are here, like uh, Eric and uh, Salston is uh, an artist yeah, I'm a fan of, if he's still here. And like, I, I'll spend a lot of time pouring over other people's art on Instagram and, uh, yeah, it's a double-edged sword that fucking Instagram. Totally. But uh but uh yeah. Yeah, great, absolutely. There's loads of great arts out there. We're in, we're living in a in a golden age for illustrating, I feel. It's right now. insane. It's like the second golden age. Yeah, it's yeah. it's insane like just how many people are out there just showing such creativity and pulling from their influences, their old you know their passions and things like that it's like a, a an overwhelming flood of uh just Good imagination shit. and and creativity like running wild and it's just it can be like i said it can be overwhelming but it's also like just totally. it's fucking cool and super inspiring and yeah the aim for this show that i'm doing is to inspire and is to make sure that like people understand that like all artists essentially have like at the core are thinking the same kinds of things like yeah is this good enough mm -hmm. oh i don't want to compare myself to this artist but it totally happens you know what i mean or right. like feeling insecure about you know whatever piece of artwork or you know um getting like hitting walls and not knowing how to or like you know I wanted to ask you about that too, but I'm just basically putting out like, you know, like what tools to use, what, what things, you know, these, these, these tiny things you, you can only um, gather from your experiences and doing it. Yeah. And the inspiration that I'm trying to put out there is to just keep drawing. If anyone's out there that like to, you know, watch these and they watch it for inspiration. Good. Yeah. That's, that's the point. You know what I mean? Like if you're aspiring to do more with art, if you're looking to make artwork for your, for a living or whatever, um, just draw, just draw as much as you can. And if you're draw passionate bad. about it, it'll come out, you know? Yeah. You gotta, um, you gotta draw, you gotta make bad art. Oh, you got to make a yeah. lot of that. You got to fall. You got to <laughs> fucking get back up, et cetera. All the, yeah. all the cliches. Um, you know what? That's, that's cool. Uh, speaking of Ian Miller, there's a oh, yeah. interview with him from, I think it's fairly recent uh, within the last several years. Um, and he, uh, he's talking about, there's one thing he mentions where he basically says like, people think that I, I'm just drawing this stuff. And he's like, no, I, I find this very difficult. He's like, right. every, every drawing I'm doing is fucking difficult. Um, and I'm just like, I'm like, okay, thank God. Because yeah, uh, like same, you know, and, um, totally. and just realizing like, uh, I don't know many, how many people here, like go to the gym or whatever, but the idea that like, when you are doing anything, like say if we're going to the gym or we're lifting weight, we're always mm -hmm. lifting heavy weight. 
it doesn't matter what the actual weight is, um, like what how much weight you can lift, whether you're benching 50 pounds or 200 yeah. pounds. It's the idea is that it's heavy for you. So you just lift whatever is heavy and it's always going to be heavy and the weight will go up, but it's always going to be fucking heavy the whole time. It's never, you're never going to get to a point where like you can just draw what you're trying to draw without effort. Like you, because the bar is going to increase all the time. So yeah. yeah, there'll be things that I used to struggle with that I no longer struggle with. Like the proportions right. of the, I mean, no, I still struggle with the proportions of the face. There, like sometimes there'll be things that I feel like I'm getting a handle on and then, you know, you discover something wrong about it and you have to change it and mm. it never ends. But the idea that like, it's fucking hard and it's hard for everyone and it's going to stay hard and, and waiting for like it. I think that there, we have a tendency to think that if it's hard, it means that like we're inherently bad at it or we mm. suck. And like, there's these other people out there that are just like shitting out good stuff and, uh, like it's no big deal, and it's like yeah. you know they 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 we talk about artists like bleeding for their art and stuff like that for a reason. Yeah. It's cliche, but it's like it's hard. It's fucking hard. It's hard to do yeah, man. anything at a high level, and and uh, it's hard to to do. I don't. Know, it's fucking hard to draw. It just is totally, dude. It it it's like uh, I feel like it's like anything else. You know what I mean? You get better at your craft as you progressively exercise that you know whatever that is mm. but yeah like that's a really cool um what is it analogy that you said about lifting weight because that's like a really good way of looking at it um yeah i totally agree that you know it's it i, I feel like i went like when i went to school someone said something along the lines of if you were perfect at art, you wouldn't even be making it because there's no challenge there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like important to, to say like, you know, we go about being creative because we want to challenge ourselves and say, look, we did that. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's what it is. There's a reward system in place. There's, you know, there's, potential that opens up from those things and it makes life worth living when you can be creative and show something that's in your head or or do something that you know makes that comes to life from something that doesn't exist in real life you know what i mean mm -hmm. or even just a recreation of something you see in real life it's all it's all impressive it's all interesting it's all you know like someone's gonna appreciate fucking squiggles on a page you know what i'm saying yeah like there's obviously there's like you should put effort into it you should obviously have passion for it you shouldn't be like some you know person just trying to you know make money at fucking garbage but you know like things that just don't have heart but um but ultimately like when you are setting your mind to doing something there's going to be a lot of hurdles. There's going to be a lot of times you're just going to be like, this looks like shit. Mm -hmm. And you got to push past that. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes even on a, a regular day, like a regular basis, when I sit down to draw something, I have to get all the garbage out first before anything good comes out. Yeah. Kind of like, you know, being rusty when you're playing your instrument, you know what I mean? You just get back into it. Yes. Muscle memory. <clears throat> Yeah, I think, like, the fact is that even when you do good art, or you if you sit down and you do a good drawing, mm -hmm. it's not like once you can sit down and do a good drawing that your problems are solved and that you just live in, like, eternal bliss after that point. Right. And, like, it's like, no, uh, you still have to exist, and you still have to keep going. Like, I... I it's like there the, the idea that one day I'll get past this point where making art is a struggle and and whatever it's like nope it's always going to be and uh, yeah you you have you probably most of us I feel probably have some kind of ideal in our heads that we're trying to like bring out and we're and every single time we uh, we make something mm -hmm. 
we will feel I'm, I'm partially I people might have mixed opinions about Nietzsche or whatever, but this is in reference to to a, a, pa a passage from the gay science by Nietzsche. And he talks about like the the like ideal of the artist is unreachable for him and always will be him or her. Uh, but the effect that it has on the person who is not the artist, who is just witnessing it, it can affect them as if the artist did achieve his his highest thing, even and, and even if he is never actually getting there all the way. So he feels as though we, we feel as though we're never reaching there. But the effect mm. that our art has on people around us, uh, it can send them to the place where like beyond where we were ever trying to get to in, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, it's a struggle, but like the, the, the end result will transcend your intentions and it will have its effect on the world regardless nice. as long as it's authentic and you actually really care about it. I think. That's yeah. What I'm saying. Hell yeah, man. Great, great words. I love that. Um, I feel like there's like a super lag. I'm looking at the live chat. Um, it was it was up like happening for you in real time earlier, right? When I was showing imagery and stuff. No, I'm I'm just seeing uh, I'm seeing the highlights only. I'm not seeing the chat. Oh, I meant like the YouTube because right now I'm looking at YouTube and I'm like on a Google search right now. <laughs> like. Uh, we're looking at Virgil Finley right now on YouTube. John Blanche. That's, That's pretty funny. Anyway, uh, Riddick had a question um, kind of a little bit ago, around quarter to eight. And he said, I see you're wearing an old tower shirt. Do you listen to other medieval inspired bands? One of my favorites is the moon lay hidden beneath a cloud. Are you familiar? Uh, no, I'm not familiar. Cool. Um, that's cool. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, but me too. Uh, other medieval inspired bands. I feel like every fucking band I listen to is medieval inspired. To be, to be honest, <laughs> um, I don't like. I would have to. Uh, can I Nerd. Killer. Honestly, Ustalost. That's the score of Vipers by Ustalost. You're gonna uh, have to spell that for me, man. Yeah, it's uh, U S T A L O S T. Okay. Usta right. Lost. Usta Lost. Um, I think it's like a Slavic word for sorrow or some shit. I don't know. Cool. But, um, fuck, uh, now I have to come up with, or I have to remember names of things. Uh, well, inspired bands. Yeah. Riddick asked also like, you know, what, what clients do you, like, what dream commissions do you have? Um, which kind of touched on what Ken asked, but right. it, is there anything else you can think of? Honestly, the stuff I'm most excited to work on these days is to work with uh, role-playing game designers cool. and, and stuff like that. I would love nice. to do more nerdy fantasy stuff. Uh, that's my, like, the, the headspace that I'm in most of the time. And Bread and butter, I, I baby. Feel like I'm like I'm forcing it to work for metal, um, but my main interest is uh, fantasy and role-playing games and stuff. So yeah. honestly, like, yeah, Dream Commissions, I don't know, I would love to work with, like, Good and Games on DCC, or I would love to work with, I mean, I would love to work with Warhammer or anything. Um, there's a bunch of great games coming out these days. Mork Borg, uh, yeah. Nice. <clears throat> That's awesome. Um, you said you mentioned you were a DM earlier. Yeah, dude, I would love to play Dungeons and Dragons as, as if you were my DM. Oh yeah, dude. I've never, I've really played only a few, like a few times. But I also imagine it's pretty advanced uh, playing with you. So like, you probably get annoyed at how novice no, I am. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Uh, I, uh, I, I like to play like old school. D and D, mm and -hmm. or at least a kind of uh, pseudo old school D and D, uh -huh. uh, and uh, it's it's like I don't know, I don't know how deep I should get into it because I could go very fucking deep. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, maybe it's off topic. But uh, I, I think it would just be cool to have you create worlds and like 
just interact with that. I, um, I have a setting that I've been making or working on for a really long time and like constantly iterating it and blowing it up and starting from scratch and taking the best bits and rebuilding it. It's coming together and I, I'm working on, I have a long-term project to, I have a system of my own, an RPG system and uh, I'm making it married to that setting and it's kind of like an OSR, like old school kind of text crawling yeah. game uh, that I want to. I'm very inspired by, there's a David Day and the books that he did, did, uh, has done, like Tolkien, the Tolkien books and just various oh. books. He works with Alan Lee and Ian Miller and John Blanche, uh, and et cetera. Um, and they're just full of fucking amazing art. And I just, that's a huge part of the appeal of RPGs and stuff for me. And, and these books is like, nice. The full of full, all of the cool art and yeah. And you can take it further with the RPG and you can kind of like immerse sure. yourself in it more. And, uh, yeah, I, that's sick. I just want to go as deep as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, dude. That's so cool. I definitely don't like, I'm not a gamer. Um, I think role playing games are pretty cool. I like, um, like the idea that you can like improv and stuff like that. And I've listened to like podcasts and what have you, um, of some cool like D and D shit, but I think it would be really fun for you to be my DM if I was like in a campaign. Dude, uh, I I'm not running it right now, but in the past I was running like an open table kind of game where there was like a sort of revolving door of people, and we would plan sessions together, and uh, yeah, it was all online. And uh, cool. so maybe we can make that happen one day. But uh, that'd be really cool, man. Are you doing stuff with like Wormwitch guys or like? Uh, no, they, I'm, I've been trying to convince them to play with me for years. <laughs> hey, uh, sometimes, but, man, you know, differences yeah. of, like, you know, interests and whatnot. Yeah, but, but uh, no, I'm just, I'm insufferable, so. You know, <laughs> but, uh, we need <laughs> this, we need that. All right, man. Like, sometimes uh, we want to fucking be in the modern day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we have to find the crystal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I when I'm when we're playing I, I actually don't role play that much I I occasionally I'll get into it I mostly like the kind of like more war gamey side of it I like uh, exploring a hex map and dungeon crawling and try and get in and out alive with your treasure and and shit it's kind of more like just shooting the shit and like hanging out in a really yeah. cool well developed fantasy world that has an internal logic so you can make interesting decisions meaningful decisions and shit but. When it comes to like talking and character and stuff, it's all just, I find role playing games inherently funny. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm just interested in laughing about shit and rolling some dice and totally. watching peasants get destroyed or sucked into wells. And that's funny. Whatever. So you mentioned peasants, and uh, like, I'm a drummer. I know you're a bassist. And yeah. like, I. <laughs> So I sit really high on my throne. Yeah. Like it's called a throne. So I like make this um this comparison where I'm like, I sit high because I want all of my drums underneath me as they're <laughs> fucking peasants and I'm just Smacking wailing away on them. Yeah, yeah. That's fucking funny. Uh, I, I sit atop my high tower and I you know beat your peasants. Spit at, spit at them. That's funny. I'm gonna tell that to my drummer. <laughs> yeah I'm gonna think about I, I play drums now and then too uh, oh sick but uh, I play drums in a band called uh, Henbane Chariot it's oh, like a cool. project that I do with a buddy of mine who may or may not be watching right now nice but um, Hell yeah. Uh, so yeah I love playing the drums too maybe I'll I'm, I'll keep beating the peasants in mind next time I'm yes the peasants. <laughs> fuck yeah it would be cool to see like a drum set that was made out of only like medieval medieval torture, <laughs> just torture racks and torture yeah, like and torture racks, and nails, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking screws and. What's your favorite medieval weapon? Fuck. Uh, We're like honestly, slop. probably just a sword. Like it's the the most <laughs> like the most glorified. But uh, I don't know. There's something about it. But 
I don't know. Uh, fucking, I love pole arms. I love pole hammers. What do they look like? Are there any in your work that we had up? Uh, there's probably some pole hammers in there somewhere. Uh, what do they look like? They they look fucking cool. I don't know. Yeah, I bet. Uh, it's like the, the, all those like late late medieval. It's very Warhammer shit. Just pole arms and uh, it's got a spike on top, a spike on the back, and a hammer on one side that is also covered in spikes. <laughs> it's just armor piercing. Yeah, that power. sounds pretty fucking gnarly. Yeah, on a big big old stick. Yeah, dude, okay. spikes are sick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, favorite medieval weapon? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. If, if I had to pick something other than a sword, which is the most obvious choice, maybe pull a hammer. Right on. Um, so I actually wanted to ask you, are you inspired anything like um, by uh, like Japanese? Like, oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, because like, I feel like some of the hand stuff like that I'm seeing is um, kind of similar to some artists that I pulled up. But do you have a specific artist that you are inspired by like as far as like japanese art is it like um samurai like artwork or yeah anything I, like that? I love i love a lot of eastern art in general um uh but i mean you know growing up in the 90s and ps2 mm -hmm. and jrpgs and anime and whatever i i have a particular interest in japan mm -hmm. and uh samurai art and old japanese like woodblock prints and yeah and stuff like that uh, but yoshitaka amano yep um, i have him on here and uh uh more recently uh my girlfriend introduced me to kawajiri and like ninja scroll and vampire hunter d and stuff like that which he did vampire hunter d was actually he was working with yoshitaka amano for like character designs and they're like oh. feature length animated films um but uh highly recommend kawajiri if you're at all interested in let me uh let me pull them up i also have utagawa uh, kuniyoshi i'm not familiar have you I heard mean, maybe so, it, but... this is 1800 stuff right here so i just wasn't sure how far back you were influenced but i can't I would... uh i can't see it if, if you want it up on the thing it's not showing um yeah i haven't put it on there yet i would need to share a new window so this is one artist that i was looking at that i saw some similarities your your hands and things like that uh, yeah i think i've inherited like by way of amato because obviously he's very influenced by traditional uh japanese art and stuff like that so uh -huh. just by way of him a lot of things that are present in in traditional japanese art have, have mm. sort of disseminated into my stuff i think um but i mean i'm genuinely interested in in a lot of this and 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 not just japanese art but eastern art in general and specifically right. the anatomy and a lot of indian art um mm -hmm. uh, for those like crazy hand forms and and stuff like that uh yeah and, and there's well, man like specifically in in samurai art and stuff and the, mm -hmm. the anatomy and the there's also this like primitive perspective and and like pushing nature really far like it's not realistic but there's a there's like a clearly there's knowledge of anatomy there but the poses are so extreme and or the gestures yeah. are extreme and you get these dudes like twisted around in super weird positions. I love that stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, like this kind of. I'm just like pulling stuff up randomly, but. I also I just love how present, like extreme violence is in this like archaic art you, you know like it's no wonder that so much anime is so fucking bloody and and <laughs> yeah. it's like always been there yeah super cool so that name utagawa kiniyoshi it keeps popping up here but there's some really yeah it's just uh it's fascinating i i actually went to a um uh 
an art gallery that had some like woodblock um, samurai artwork and it was just incredible to look at but i can't remember for the life of me where i know it was in upstate new york i think it was at the corning uh glass museum okay they also had like features of other other artists but um oh i love that horse guy on horseback there that you were just looking at yeah 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 i wish i could make it bigger but i cannot um there's something about like the silhouette yeah yes yeah, i feel so, like yeah yeah i mean yeah the and yeah obviously i feel like you are um very interested in silhouette formation like things that you know totally i i i like to think first about the silhouette and then the uh -huh. details that go inside are kind of like a bonus. Like after you get the initial impression of the silhouette, then mm. you can like dive in and, and like travel along the the drawing and see the see the details and like find secret hidden things and stuff like that. Yes. Um, but the general impression first comes from like if this was just black and white, would it look cool? You know? Right. Um, and so I'm always looking for interesting forms, like these antlers on top of that guy's helmet that you were just showing there, and mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that that I can put on top of a helmet, or like why do I like a particular weapon over another, or an right. armor, or a gesture? It's like it's all I'm just looking for. I don't know uh, the shape of a wing and stuff like that. It's the shape and of everything is so important to me. Um, right even beyond like how I'm rendering it or, or what it actually is in the first place. Um, yeah, unless this... I find something that works, I'll just fucking use it over and over and over and over again. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love that. I love to see common theme, you know, in people's artwork, just to really be able to identify it. Um, and like, I can notice as soon as I see a piece from you, I know that it's from you. Um, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, like that's, I think that's like a, a special like facet of people's artwork that I really look for. Um, you know, like I love doing that for logos too. Like when I see a certain logo, I'm like, Oh, okay. David Mickelson made this. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I can just tell because it's like drippy and there's like body parts and yeah. like a specific treatment of the ink, like, you know, like wherever, or like, Oh, this is a Nev uh, gruesome graphics because of like how, you know just the sliminess or like whatever you know like the um amorphous shape like it's, you know he told me that once uh that that sometimes he'll use his his opposite hand that he's used to drawing with just Ooh. so he can figure out a, a strange like unused shape oh, to yeah. make a logo inside <clears throat> that's cool yeah it's so yeah. easy to fall into into patterns and you just like default to this thing then you're like oh, i'm like oh man i'm always starting from the same point that's a, totally. that's a great, uh, yeah so maybe like it. if you're ever struggling uh yeah i wanted to ask you about this but maybe if you're ever struggling to do that for a silhouette you know what yeah. i mean yeah. but um i wanted to ask you what you go about doing like how you go about um getting over blocks like art artistic walls and blocks honestly i i recently have been struggling with with like our creative blog mm. over the past honestly for the past like year or so and you mm. might not be able to tell because i've been putting out work but uh it's been i'm like why am i making this and like like do i want to be making this and right what should i be drawing and it, it is this really what i want to be drawing you know um, yeah and uh I've done lots of different things, like kind of like blitz sketching, where I will just take mm -hmm. an ink, my pen, and I'll, without pencil, just like start rendering things that I, uh, I guess, already understand or, uh, sure, and and just trying shit and like, based on that kind of principle of like you have to draw bad stuff to make good stuff. 
um, and to just like draw lots of stuff that looks like shit and just kind of get it out of my system. Yeah. And occasionally there'll be like a little gem or something that works in there. Um, mm. And you can kind of, I'll like kind of rebuild my confidence, like drawing something that I really understand well and being like, okay, I can draw something that's cool. Um, and not being afraid to just like tread old ground sometimes. Like, okay, I've drawn a knight a hundred mm. times. Like I can draw another knight. It's okay. You know, like I, I don't, I don't always have to be like breaking new ground with everything all the fucking time. Like why, right. why should I expect that of myself? Um, but lately I think that uh, my way that I got through like a block that I was having was just thinking that I think I'm, my ego was too present. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I was thinking too much about like what the client was going to want from the drawing. Like, is this what they want from me? Is this what they're going to, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I had to turn myself away from like, what they are expecting or what I should be doing and turn myself back to what is the stuff that I love the most. Right. You know, and be like, I'm making this as like an homage to that stuff. Not because mm -hmm. I have any sort of special thing to show to this world that hasn't ever existed before. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make this as an act of worship to that thing. And yeah. so long as I feel like I am worshiping it, then whatever comes out is good and i don't right need to i don't need to be so perfect about it and because it's a it's a fallacy like to believe that i can make something perfect in the first place and so as soon <laughs> as i start thinking about it that way i will not be able to make anything and so yeah. like, turn it away from myself and turn it towards the thing that's bigger than myself that i'm aiming towards that that many other people are aiming towards right you know? um then ideas just start flowing out much easier. And there's there, like it, whether or not it's good enough for me or for the client becomes mm -hmm. relevant. And it's like, just, is this in service to the muse? If right. so, proceed. If not, do something else, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, nice. I mean, yeah. Blocks and walls are definitely uh, sticky situations for all different artists, and and they they handle them in different ways that are always fascinating to hear because you know we all like go through and do different things. Um, but one that I'll point out that um, that Mark Riddick mentioned in our talks. Um, he showed like just what he does by making pretty much kind of what you were saying with things he's familiar with, things he knows he wants to incorporate in his work that he already does and things he like naturally already understands because he's done them so much. And he just draws like little thumbnails of them and then he'll like bring them into Photoshop and like mish, mish, mix, mash, mix, match them. And like until he finds some composition that he can kind of bite into That's and cool. uh, pretty interesting. Um, you should definitely check that episode out. I'll, uh, I'll link you to it. Yeah, okay, um, cool. And that's uh, something I definitely um, hope that people that are watching this um, will take some time to check out my older episodes with other artists. Um, I'm still uploading older episodes. So, keep a lookout for, you know, if you subscribe and you get notifications on, you'll see that I've uploaded a new episode probably like at least once every few days I'm trying. So, you know, I've done this. This is, this is essentially the 25th episode, um, okay, yeah. but it's the first YouTube live episode. So it's like, you know, I called it 25th in the one, one, you know, but yeah, man, like, everyone's got their own way of getting over those hurdles. And like, it was interesting to see Mark just kind of, these are all the things you see in my work. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of like find ways to make them work. You know, he's got like a stairwell and he's got like a reaper or like an archway and a, and a, uh, you know, like a, a, a cemetery scene, like a quick, you know, like just like these simple ideas that still i would never be able to like sketch out the way that he did but 
yeah, it's definitely worth checking out if anyone's interested in seeing. Um, I might make a specific clip just of him explaining it, so it's not like you have to scroll through the whole episode. That's cool. Um, it just takes some time to get all that stuff edited. But um, uh, we should probably uh, bring it to a close soon. Um, yeah. I did get a special email from someone who wasn't able to join us, and so I wanted to make sure to ask the question that they emailed. Okay. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, put them in now so that we can make sure to answer them before we get off. Um, this person, Mal Perito, said, when will your commissions be open again? Oh. <laughs> uh, honestly, I have no idea. I, I'm up to my eyeballs right now, and I'm trying to honestly keep them closed for the, for the foreseeable future so I can clear out the current mountain of work that I have and sure. start working on some personal projects. So I really can't say um, with any confidence when they will reopen. Got you. So being so booked, are you a full-time artist? I am now, yeah. Nice, dude. Congrats. That's fucking sweet. How long has it been? It's been just over a year now. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. Very cool, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy i don't know what the fuck i'm doing at all but we're making it work somehow you're you're crushing it buddy <laughs> just you know keep doing you and stay passionate about it and people are gonna respond positively and you'll have consistent work and obviously you have there's a there's a uh there's people that are interested in having you jump back in when you're available but yeah, people that are asking about open commissions and things like that, um, you know, they you have to just try to understand that artists are doing as much as they can to be able to open. They're not always <laughs> just closing off the doors because yeah, they just feel like it. You know, it's just gets, oh, I feel you like don't want to <laughs> shortchange any clients by not putting enough effort into something and rushing it just to get it done. So you have room to get something else done. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's one of those things where like, especially being, uh, I don't know. Are, are you full-time illustrator at this point? I'm not actually, I, um, I'm part-time, uh, at a day job and you know, like there's, there's things that I enjoy about physical labor. Um, like, you know, certain little rewards, uh, yeah. that I find from it. But, um, ultimately I think I would like to be a full-time illustrator. I just haven't made that, that jump just yet. Um, mm -hmm. just cause doing so requires feeling stable enough and consistent enough work, but I don't want to take on too much and then d disappoint people. And it's, like yeah, way, way too hard, long. Yeah. So I've been kind of like, you know, it's been a, it's been a balancing act for a few years <laughs> now, but I will get there. I know I will. <clears throat> yeah. That's cool. Uh, I sincerely hope so. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah. It was, uh, for me, I was doing labor jobs as well and mm -hmm. working night shift and yeah. whatever. I was yeah. going to bed at 5 a.m. every night and waking <laughs> up at noon or later Dude. and then drawing and then going to work and, Eventually, I, I put a, a had a chunk of savings and I was like, this could get me through like a year, maybe if I don't, didn't work at all. That's even good, man. Totally so That's I and I was like, it would be I have to burn the return ships and just like dive in and do it. And uh, and then I just quit my fucking job. Burn the return ship. I just I love these quotables, man. <laughs> I'm fucking picking, good. I'm, I'm picking them up from somewhere else, but uh dude, burn the return ship. That's so sick. <laughs> I'll be burning the return ship sometime soon, I'm sure. Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Um I wanna get to this question before we close out here. Um so Jake Hodgson, um, also known as oh, what was his name on uh Dungeon Dot Slayer on Instagram. Okay. Um, he said, Hey Robin, firstly, I wanted to say, uh, say thank you for your art. Since I stumbled across your work, you've been become probably 
one of my favorite artists. Everything you produce is so insanely sick, and the level of detail, imagination, medieval fantasy vibe, and execution is just mad and a step above anything I've seen before. I used to draw a fair amount as a kid, but haven't in years and years. But seeing your stuff inspired me to pick up a pencil and pen again. Nowhere near the kind of level you're on, but I've started doing some doodling in my spare time and loving it. Hell yeah, dude. That's Hell awesome. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to be cheeky and ask two questions, if that's all right. Which I'm going to say both questions, but we already answered the, uh, the first one. Firstly, okay. I wanted to ask what the inspiration for your subject matter and style. And secondly, why do you think it's important to have fantasy-based art slash stories in the modern world very interesting um thank you jake hodgson i believe he's yeah. coming from australia cheers. cheers jake uh that's really surreal to hear for me but uh to answer the question why do i think it's important is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's important to have medieval uh, imagery and storytelling in modern day, basically? I don't know if fantasy. I art. think it's important to have strictly medieval imagery. Um, Sorry, not not medieval. I apologize. Um, <laughs> it says, why do you think it's important to have fantasy based art slash stories in the modern world? I think that fantasy serves as a vehicle for like really ancient archetypes that still ring true to us and they allow us to look at the world in a more like elemental state away from all of the like confusing context of what's happening around us. It's hard to mm -hmm. separate like random phenomena from, uh, broader cycles or things that are happening to us as like human beings and things yep. that unite us as being human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are certain things that are like spears through time that ring true to human beings, no matter what context they're in and fantasy being somewhat supernatural mm -hmm. um, in the sense that it, represents elemental things that we that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and presents them to us in an archetypal or mythic context yeah i i think that it serves this a similar purpose if not the same purpose as myth and stories have for since the dawn of time since the dawn of civilization so i think those things are inextricably linked together and I personally use fantasy as a for myself to organize mm -hmm. my thoughts on like broader things that I witness in my own life, my own experience. Right. Um, and uh, I just think that archetypes, specifically of an archaic variety, are I mean, I find it appealing when they're expressed in, in with this kind of imagery or when it's medieval fantasy or whatever. It doesn't necessarily yeah. need to be that. I'm writing Tolkien's coattails like the rest of us. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's basically it. I don't know if that makes nice. any fucking sense at all. but <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think absolutely it does. And I think um, uh, Jake, I think it was, uh, will be uh, more than uh, elated to have had you answer such a question so cool. <clears throat> awesome man um yeah so uh it looks like riddick says great conversation looking forward to seeing more of your work robin love your style and subject matter cheers hell yeah uh, cheers likewise. mark <clears throat> say again i said likewise tomorrow Fuck yeah <laughs> All right. Uh, the Nameless Mist said, great interview. Thank you, dude. Appreciate it. Please come again. I hope you guys that are all watching um, take a minute to subscribe to my channel. I'm going to be doing this every month. I've got some really cool artists uh, lined up. So um, 
I hope to see everybody coming through and asking cool questions and, you know, you'll be able to watch this later. Um, I'm going to have it posted. I might edit uh, the intro out just because, or not the intro, but like the, before we got going. Right. Um, so it's not just like some, you know, thing that you have to watch that makes less sense. Yeah. Anyway, um, dude, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today and talk to us and just kind of shed some light on where you come from with your art and, you know, your passions. And it's it's fucking really cool. Um, thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I, uh, it was a pleasure, dude. And uh, I'm humbled that anyone is interested at all and wants to know, like, it's uh it's new for me so yeah i'm just fucking i'm pleased that i love talking about it and uh i'm pleased to talk with other artists about the craft and uh it's like an endless an endless thing right so we can yeah. we and we should be talking about it we should be sharing our ideas with each other and i like that you're doing this so yeah I'm happy yeah. to have been included in the your great pantheon of artists that you have brought on yourself included Thanks, man. Yeah, it, it really is like a cool thing to be able to pick brains of other artists that I admire. Um, and you serve as inspiration, um, I'm sure, for many, uh, including myself. So it's really a treat. Thank you, man. Um, I think at this point, uh, we're going to sign off. Uh, I want to thank everybody that came into the chat, asked questions, uh, stayed engaged. Um, really appreciate you guys. And, uh, yeah, if you like this, please tell other people about it, share it. Um, and, uh, I'll probably make some clips of this and, uh, tag you and cool. we can try and, you know, get the word out that I'm doing this more. And, um, yeah, I want to, I just oh, want to yeah. grow this. I want to make this, um, something that people can really enjoy. So I think, I think it's fucking awesome. So I, Thanks. yeah. I wish you all the success with that. And fucking, Thank you, man. I'll, I'll definitely help you share some stuff for sure. Cool. I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it has been very helpful. Thank you for uh, being so um, uh, hands-on with that as well, this promo and all that. Um, okay, I got to figure out uh, if there's anything else I need to do before we close out here. Um, I'm going to probably hit the big red button that says end broadcast. I know that that's going to be a thing. <laughs> Um, I <laughs> uh, appreciate all you guys. Uh, Eric Wolf, uh, hell yeah, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, Mark Riddick, we got Jota Cravo on here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, I will say that Jota Cravo is my next guest. Oh, fuck uh, yeah, so that's gonna be rad. Um, okay. looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, there. and there'll be like an announcement about that soon. Um, Thank you for taking the time, uh, Yoto, because I know that you're, like, doing a party right now. <laughs> so oh, shit. he, like, sent me a picture of, like, a fucking backyard party, like, you know, scene of, like, I think there might have been a pinata. I don't know. But, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ian Colazzo's on here. Um, he's an awesome artist as well. Thank you for joining, man. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and you absolutely will see more interviews. So I've got I've got artists booked all the way up till uh, December. So oh, I am really fucking stoked. And um, yeah, and and more coming after that. So this is uh, this is just the the fucking tip of the the top the <laughs> tip of the iceberg, whatever the fuck that saying is. I'm sure you have a cooler one. <laughs> no. <laughs> God, would you say burning the return ship? Burn the return ships, yeah. Oh my God, I fucking love that. I'm gonna do that shit. Hell yeah, dude. Um, think about it. Yeah, I, oh, dude, I'll think before I ink. I'll, I know that. <laughs> All right, well, I hope you have a good rest of your evening there, sir. Uh, it's probably yeah. what? Uh, five o'clock there, 5.30? Nice. Well, you've got a good chunk of your uh, your night ahead of you. You can do like cool stuff with it. So yeah. I'm going to yeah. sign off and stop keeping you from doing rad artwork or whatever yeah. you're going to do. You're keeping me from procrastinating on the shit I'm supposed to be doing. So 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that. I feel that. Um, all right, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm going to end the broadcast. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Robin Harris. Really fucking appreciate it, dude. Uh, have a good night, everybody. Cheers. I'm hitting Cheers. the button. I'm hitting the fucking button. Bye.